Hello and welcome to Let Me Bore You to Sleep. This is Healing Thursday. Please only listen when you can safely close your eyes. Now, this recording is going to be about caring for people with illness, someone with an illness, and I suppose I'm particularly focusing on mental illness, people with mental health issues. I'm coming at this with a perspective, or from the perspective of someone with mental health issues, bipolar and uh, EUPD, E, yeah, EUPD, which is a personality disorder, Uh, but yeah, so I'm coming from that perspective, but I think really I'm just coming from a human perspective. Like I'm gonna be, I'm gonna pretend to be a human today. So, this might not be the most uplifting, funniest recording I've ever done. So, if you're, it, it might not be the best recording to listen to to go to sleep. So, I realise it's part of the let me boy to sleep things, but just let you know straight away. So, if it's it's it might it's not so light hearted as what I normally do. So that's that's that really, I'm just letting you know. But I'm doing this because it's been requested and I so said this is for Kara. And it's for anyone else that's in a similar situation and that's dealing with are kind of being forced really to deal with somebody that's very unwell, someone you care about that's very unwell mentally. Um, I'm also, I would say that that or that would apply to people that were physically unwell because the mental health issue comes in anyway. Uh, I think it'd be hard to find someone that was constantly physically ill with a long-term illness where it hasn't affected their mental health. I'd be very, I mean, I'm not sure if such a person exists. So, you know, the mental health issue is part of that. And then there are some people that are predominantly, it's the mental health part that is the issue, not a physical, I say physical illness, to be fair, things like bipolar, it is a physical thing, it's an organic thing, it's in the brain, it's not, it's caused by the brain being different. Um, so, you know, for all, all different ways for not getting enough of certain chemicals or certain hormones or whatever could be the cause of mental health issues, as well as, of course, things like trauma and emotional issues as well. So it's a very complicated subject. I'm, I'm in no way an I feel a bit, sound a bit blocked up, don't I? I'm in no way, I'm in no way an expert on this subject or any other subject. So I'm not talking as a professional of anything. Although I have in the past dealt with people with mental health issues in a professional capacity as a counsellor for, I don't know, three and a half years in the past. So I've got a little bit of experience of that. 
and I've also dealt with my own mental health issues since I was a child. Uh, so yeah, I've got, I got experience, but I, I am and never will be an expert on anything. Uh, I hope to well, I hope to get close to being an expert on myself, but even now, um, I am surprised at how sometimes how little I've learnt. Something happened yesterday, and I said all the wrong things, and it's like I'm fifty four. Have I not learned anything? Especially with communication and stuff like that. I've really tried to study that stuff, but uh, yeah. So just just as long as you know, I'm not trying to be an expert on any subject. I never have tried to be. So I guess you could say this is all just an opinion or... I'd, I'd like, I prefer rather than opinion, my experience, my personal experience with caring. So I'm going to focus not on myself, but focusing on what it can be like, or what I've found it to be like, caring for someone that's ill, like long term. Uh, and I want to focus on that subject. So as I said, it's not, it's, there might be the odd laugh, I don't know, because I've, I've got no idea what I'm going to talk about. I don't know what I'm going to say. So, and if I do say something that sounds flippant, then that might also happen as well. I might say something that sounds insensitive. I may say the wrong thing. I've, my whole life I've been saying the wrong thing. But just know, or please remember that I'm not attempting to make light of anything that's happened and I'm not trying to make fun of anything really although I might make fun of it but just in a way maybe to deal with it to cushion the blow a bit look you know if that makes sense so um, so I'm going to talk about my friend who is ill and this is someone that I was probably arguably the closest to the closest human being I've ever been closest to ever in my entire life someone I saw pretty much every day for nine years and it was also one of the hardest hardest things I've ever had to kind of go through as well however the thing I want to um, the thing I want to actually and I'll say it right at the beginning really the thing that I want to put forward the idea that I want to put forward is for those that are caring for someone whether it's physical whatever the illness is Your best is good enough. Okay? Your best is good enough. No matter what the outcome, no matter what that person says to you, no matter what that person that you've been caring for does to anyone else or themselves, no matter what verbal, horrible stuff they may say, If you've done your best, you've done your best. You can't do any more than that. Because from my own experience, there's the whole, which I've had this many times, could I have done more? Well, maybe. But at what cost? And would it have helped? You know, could I? I could have sat down there with, with him. Sixteen hours a day, I could have moved in with him, or got him to move in here and had him in a bed here and just been with him twenty-four hours a day. 
what would have that done to what if, what would have that have done to me to my mental health no matter how selfish that might sound sometimes I had to have a break in order to recharge so then I could be for him be there for him the next day or maybe two days later maybe I need a couple of days to just do my own thing and then I can be there for him so yeah that whole idea of if you've done your best that's enough if you did your best at the time and of course we can always like well I can improve upon that I could have done this I could have done that yeah but you didn't you can only really comment on what you did do not what you didn't do otherwise the what you didn't do is just a huge bunch of stuff and there's no kind of no sense in that really it's not useful to you I'm guessing and hasn't been any use to me thinking of the things that I could have done so I've literally thought oh I should have moved him upstairs but I know I'd have ended up hating him he probably would have ended up hating me I'm not a good person to live with or I haven't been so far and I know that we would have got on each other's nerves and that wouldn't have been good because maybe that had lasted a couple of weeks and we may never have spoken to each other again which would be the opposite to what is what I wanted because then how could I have been there for him for the, the next because really it was the last two years that were the worst that's when he really went downhill my friend and it's been happening for a long time and he went through periods but this is this was the worst part the last two years before he passed away last November so Vinny what are you doing he's a little bit restless I think he wants to go free W A N W A L K, but uh, now he's now going to come for a cuddle. That's it. Good. I've had a headache for about three days now. It's not as bad today, but it's just maybe I'm not drinking enough water. I don't know. I'll be all right. I'm going to go. I'm going to take him for a long one when I've done this in the fields so he'll enjoy that uh, so my experience I'd say the hardest the hardest thing I think I'm trying to think what the hardest parts of it is feeling yeah feeling useless which I did a lot of the time I felt absolutely useless to him even though he used to tell me that I was helping uh, but I still felt that if I was helping he would be getting better he would be improving not getting worse and I mean technically I know enough about mental health issues and mental disease or whatever you, whatever you want to call it to know that I wasn't enough to make it get better he needed serious professional help and possibly a change of medication and I would argue time in hospital both physically and mentally near the end he had a lot of physical problems, uh, which I won't go into out of respect. Oh, my stomach's gurgling. That's weird. But I won't go into the like the personal stuff out of respect for him because I wouldn't want him talking about my personal stuff. 
I'm not going to mention his name or who he is anyway. But I'm just going to talk about my experience caring for him. And it won't be personal. It will be personal about me rather than about him. My experience and how it affected me. And so I guess it's... Yeah, I'm turning something very serious about him and making it all about me, maybe. Narcissistic, possibly. Oh, well. There you go. There, there we go again. It's all about JJ. It's kind of strange. I think the hardest thing about... The two hardest things... I don't know. There's, there's so many hard things about it. One was... And this sounds like a ridiculous statement. But sometimes I needed to be ill. A weird statement to make. But some I had I got bipolar. Sometimes I need to be or sometimes I I just need to well, sometimes I was ill. It wasn't I needed to be, but I was. I was unwell. And sometimes perhaps I needed somebody to care for me. But what caring for me meant is leaving me alone. That's how I'm cared for. I need to be alone and to deal with it on my own. Maybe practical help's good. Collected a prescription from the doctors for me. If I've run out of milk, maybe getting me some milk. Maybe helping with Vinny for a few days. Stuff like that. I don't have anyone to call up, get help like that anymore. And my friend did do stuff, you know, he would, he would do stuff for me. If he could. But for the last couple of years. He was so far gone. Uh, physically. Mentally. Everything. And. The hardest things is. I'm trying to think what the hardest parts were. In some ways the hardest part wasn't even him dying. Because I'd spent at least a year expecting to find him gone. At least a year. Like constantly. And years before that wondering when it's going to be. Because of the constant times that he tried to leave. I've well, been very careful with my language, but at the same time, I'm still talking about the same stuff. So, as I said, if this is, I'm not here to upset anybody. This is really a. I just don't want to upset anyone, you know what I mean? I upset someone yesterday in the park because of Vinny. Vinny attacked a little puppy. Like, out of super excitement and I said all the wrong things I was trying to make it better verbally but it wasn't working uh, anyway I have to move on from that that's a different story so not being able to help him not really feeling that I was able to help him because I, I like solutions. You know, if... So when I went to doctors and they said, our blood sugar level was way too high, I was pre-diabetic, I needed to cut sugar out. The solution was there. It was an easy solution. I cut sugar out and my blood sugar level went down again. After a few months, it was at a good level. Maybe not perfect, but it was at a much better level. The, the the rest would just be probably sorted out by exercise. Just to burn that excess, you know, sugar off that's within the food that I ate. But there was a it was a practical thing that I could do. I lost weight, which was something I needed to do, and yeah, all those things that helped. And it's like, okay, a solution. 
not an enjoyable solution, but it was a solution. For him, there was two things that he needed to do. Three things, really. As far as... It might have been a solution, but it might not have been. So his lifestyle to stop alcohol and the other stuff and to also stop smoking that like cigarettes the cigarettes was because of his lungs he had uh, really bad lungs but he did cut down he got to the point where he could hardly smoke a cigarette because his he had uh, really bad asthma and also oh, I forget what it's called um Blimey, what's it called? Anyway, it's a really serious uh, lung lung disease. So inherited as well. I think he's, he's got it in his family. So he struggled to walk up the stairs or do anything. Uh, really, you know. I mean, he came back from the petrol station once, which is probably a ten minute walk from here, and he came back. And there was a knock on my door, and he opened the door and he collapsed, collapsed inside my door, couldn't breathe. And I said, "Oh, where's your, where's your inhaler? COPD, that's it. COPD." He had. I said, "Where's your inhaler?" He said, "It's downstairs." Well, I didn't. Okay. Uh, he gave me his key. I went downstairs, got his inhaler. I just grabbed all of them. I didn't know which one was he needed. And I got him sitting down on a chair and he took the inhaler and it took about 20 minutes before he was kind of back in action. But he, you know, and when he could breathe again, when he could like talk normally, I said, why didn't you just go straight into your flat? Well, first of all, why didn't you take the inhaler with you? Because I bought him a, a necklace thing where the inhaler went into because he kept forgetting to take it out with him. I said, you need it with you. That's the whole point of it. I mean, it, technically, even if you're in another room in your in your flat, if you're in the toilet or whatever, have it around your neck unless you can use it. You know, when you're in the kitchen, but because um, he was collapsing. Uh, anyway, he he said the reason he knocked on my door. It's because he'd forgotten it. I said, well, why don't you go in? Go straight into your flat. It's downstairs. And get it. He said he didn't know if he'd make it. He didn't know if he'd, he'd, he might get in the flat, but then he might collapse and not make it to get to the inhaler. So he came to my door knowing that he'd be safe. Either way, he'd be with someone and he'd be safe. And I could get him help if needed. And I could... I, I'd get... Yeah, I'd, I, he just... That was the logic, and I understand it. it. Makes sense, I suppose. Just for me, I would like get in my own flat and do it, but he'd thought beyond that. So maybe in the past he had done that, and he got into the flat, and he'd only just got there in time. So that's how bad his uh, chest was. So that was like a physical thing. There was other physical issues. He had a really, really bad stomach and was getting tested for that during lockdown just before lockdown and then everything kind of stopped and they weren't didn't know if he had celiac disease or something and it it got a test they lost the sample bless them and then he see this this is going to be so i'm not an N i'm not a nhs basher so those that you know the NHS is a national health service in in England. I realise people in England or the in the UK will be going. We know what it is, but there's people all around the world listening to this, so I like to just explain what it is. So, national health service is our healthcare system: uh, hospitals, paramedics, uh, out of patients, doctor surgeries. St I'm proper gurgling my stomach. Some dental surgeries, although most of them are kind of 
part NHS, mainly private these days, which isn't so good. Um, there's lots of other things that the NHS do as well. It's the biggest employer in the country, as far as I'm aware. And it's, I love the NHS. I'm, I'm a, I'm a big fan, advocate, whatever you want to say. However, this isn't dismissing the NHS being amazing. In this instance, there was some failure. Um, I think one of the problems is that maybe needs to be addressed from the specialist's pers pers perspective from that angle is and even the mental health team there seems to be this uh, and I noticed this when I was doing counselling this ideology that the person has to make an effort themselves if the customer or the patient rather not the customer if the patient doesn't make an effort themselves and they don't need they don't deserve to be treated if the um, alcoholic doesn't make an effort to stop drinking, then, you know, they won't get treated. If the drug addict doesn't make an effort to stop taking drugs, they won't get treated. They won't. And that, to me, shows a real lack of understanding of addiction. Someone needs a di the re needs a the only reason they need treatment is because they can't stop. That's the whole point of it. They need treatment. If someone can like, I remember my friend. She had a gastric gastric band thing, like an actual operation, and yeah, she was well, she was over overweight and stuff. I don't want to say anything. I'd, about her personally because she was my friend but she was overweight she she asked to have the gastric band she had to lose I think two stone or three stone before they would do the operation just to prove that she was serious and that can you imagine how many people are not able to do that because the reason, perhaps the reason so so large, is due to an eating issue, an eating disorder where they can't stop eating. It was for her as well, actually. But so that's what needs to be addressed. So the whole thing about the gastric band is it stops someone from being able to eat the way they did. It like physically stops them in the same way as if you, if uh, there's a tablet you can give to alcoholics that stops them. It doesn't work for severe alcoholics, apparently, but it's a drug that actually makes them ill when they take when they put alcohol in the body. I know alcoholics that have actually over overridden it by drinking, which is amazing. That like even something and some and also something that a lot of people might not know, and I didn't know this, and I'm going to generalize, but I'm going to keep it local. But it's a generalization. Methadone which is given to people who are on heroin, maybe crack as well, I don't know, in order to... is a replacement. It's a replacement for heroin. Quite often, what it is in reality is an addition to heroin. That's what's so ridiculous about it. And the tablets, I forget what they call it, that is um, sub sub something, a subby they call it, and they sell it to each other and stuff. 
and they saw people that are on um, the script. They call it script, which is either they get um, sometimes they get morphine and have to take it or some uh, derivative of morphine, and they might have to take it every day in front of the chemist to prove they're taking it, and then eventually they can take it home and do it like take it you know collect it every two weeks or every two days in every week or you know and then they gradually reduce the amount that's something that I know people do and I was quite surprised at this is when they get onto the script and they plan to do it before they get tested to see kind of what level they're at they take a huge amounts of drugs the night before, maybe before they even get there, so that their script will be higher, so their morphine dose will be higher. So maybe the the week before they'll take loads and loads and loads and loads. And I've actually known people that do this. I don't know if it's just I mean, it just it might just be a local thing. It might not be a national thing. But you know why my friend didn't want to be on the script? Because he had been. Been on morphine. He'd been on the sub. I can't remember what it is. Subbies they call them. They're, they're really strong. Uh, he used to take them sometimes. But they sell it amongst each other. Cause they give it to each other and stuff. Um, the, the people living that lifestyle. He didn't like going to the, there was like a local charity kind of rehabby place where people with alcohol issues, um, um, drug issues, addiction issues would go to and they would get support, get counselling um, that maybe they had to go there because they were on a script, so they had to go every week for however long. Some people would get that, get sent there as part of their probation or part of their suspended sentence. You know, they, it's part of the treatment, uh, rehabilitation or whatever. He didn't like going there because he knew if he went there, he'd end up back on drugs again because that was what they did. They'd go there, people would congregate, go there, and then, not everyone, obviously, not everyone, but he said there's a group of people that would go there, they'd leave, and they'd all go into the park and smoke crack and stuff. Like, what? Don't the people that run that centre know that that's what they're doing? I mean, it kind of defeats the object, doesn't it? Well, slightly. It's just like a bunch of, you know, if you go to AA, Alcoholics Anonymous, and then all, it might as well just meet in the pub and have a few drinks each. I mean, it's not, that's not the way, is it? It's not going to do the job. See, that's what I meant by flippancy. That was probably a flippant remark. But it's true, though, isn't it? It's just ridiculous, like... Anyway... But they do. Some people do get tested, so they're, they're limited. But they know they know their way around the tests. You know, if that's your lifestyle, you get to know everything about what you need to do, what you need to do, where you need to go to do it, and and so much of that is due to mental health. The thing is. Someone might start doing drugs because of their mental illness. And then drugs just make the mental illness worse. I mean, I think anyone, even if they were in the best of mental health, starts taking hard drugs regularly, you know, to the point where they're getting addicted, they got, they're going to have serious mental health issues. Because just because of the drugs, the lifestyle, the things they end up doing, all the lies they have to tell, the maybe the stealing, 
the losing family members because of their behavior all that stuff is just uh, I know a little bit about the old drug addiction scene and it's awful there's nothing nice about it at all it's not just about overdoses it's the whole thing there's nothing nice other than maybe a social element people get to spend time with people where maybe they would have been on their own I'd rather be on my own than be in a room full of drug addicts or alcoholics that were actively you know taking stuff I mean because that's not a safe environment I don't think never felt safe in that environment and I've been in that environment many times in the past including when I was a child apparently so a very young child but chaos I was almost born into chaos and that's the other thing chaos you can't stop someone from being chaotic you can try but you know what they really want even if they don't know it it's like what they seem to really want is everyone else to join in with their chaos I know that my friend wanted me to join in he didn't want me he, he much prefer me to be part of what he's doing than to be outside perhaps being a bit too judgy at times which I probably was but it's hard to be part of it and also help so how am I supposed to help him to stop drinking if I'm also drunk all the time it's, it's an impossible situation and as it turns out I never helped him to stop anything so yeah feeling a failure is kind of okay it's natural because you can't help someone you can't help sometimes you can't help them but it doesn't doesn't mean you don't try so that's that's kind of where I'm with that in the sense of what I did I did my best and that was enough and if you've done your best that's enough and sometimes it may not feel like it's your best of course it probably won't feel like it's your best maybe even in the moment like maybe I could do more but you know you also got to look after yourself and it's like I'm not going to start saying cliches like well if you don't look after yourself you can't look after anyone else um, however true it is it's just do we need any more of that it's the whole thing I remember someone saying well if you can't love yourself you'll never love anyone else it's absolute bollocks I understand where they're coming from but no it's not true I love my nan I've never loved myself I've never particularly liked myself but I've liked plenty I've lo I liked other people the idea is you can't love anyone else if you don't love yourself no silly absolutely silly I mean I imagine I can see you'd be more open to be more open towards other people and be more positive towards other people if if I was more positive towards myself yeah I, that makes sense I'd perhaps have more love in me towards other people if I had some towards myself yeah it makes sense but to be so like damn right you know, that's the line if you don't if you don't love yourself you can't love anyone else no ridiculous some of those uh, cliches it's like I don't know what, why people don't know why really what's the point in them anymore 
nothing's black and white nothing's that simple really things are as simple as we allow them to be I guess uh, take the emotions out and a lot of things are quite simple and also people's lifestyles because you know I had a friend that he could not get his head around my anxiety or depression or mental health stuff he couldn't get his head around it It, his attitude was why don't I just buck my ideas up be more positive Um, you you shouldn't take medication all the time they're not not it's not supposed to be long term okay what's your alternative my friend and he just really didn't get it almost like I was putting it on and he didn't get it and then a few years later he was on antidepressants for you know depression and I think he kind of might slightly got got the thing because it isn't something that you can control if it was who would choose to be depressed you know some people would but generally I don't think many people would no. really is I don't think many out there would take it as a lifestyle choice. Nor looking after someone or trying to care for someone that's mentally ill or physically ill. I mean, if you open it up to the physically ill, then millions upon millions of people have cared for someone that's ill. And it is, in my experience, one of the hardest things ever. I've never had to, luckily, never had to deal with, uh, like a child, I don't have any kids, so I haven't had to deal with that. I haven't never got married, so I've not had to deal with a wife, or never had any of my brothers get ill. I'm not really close to to them anyway really but so I've never had to go through that with a family member other than with my nan and hers was due to be 96 years old she basically just just, uh, her whole body was given up really just due to her age and that was horrible to see but it wasn't um It was just different. Does that make sense? It was... It was... Yeah. I've seen the beginnings of... uh, No, actually, both both my step-parents, my step-grandparents, both had dementia. And that was shocking, to see the changes. I wasn't their carers, though, but I did care... Uh, I didn't hardly speak to him. My step granddad, he was just didn't say hardly anything to me the whole time I knew him. But my step grandmother, we got on so well. We chatted for hours. We'd always have something to talk about. Everything and nothing, you know. We just just chat. She was funny. She made me laugh. I made her laugh. So full of energy. And, yeah, she went downhill really quickly to the point where she wasn't even, couldn't communicate. And that was very painful because I wouldn't see her very often. And then, so every time I saw her, she was way worse than if I'd have seen her, you know, regularly. Because I didn't live near where she was living. No, that's not really an excuse, but... I just didn't know what to do in that situation. I'd never gone through the experience of actually caring for someone until my friend got ill. And he, he used to call me his carer. And I said, I'm not your carer. He used to tell everyone I was his carer. 
and I never did personal care um, other than I think putting ointment on his back once I think that's about it but I didn't do any personal stuff I'd, I'd help him out but he yeah he was a very uh, I suppose a proud man or whatever so he didn't ever really ask for any help sometimes he'd come and have a bath in my bath because he was worried that he'd drown because he had a habit of falling asleep in the bath and he's, he was scared scared to have a bath and so yeah sometimes I'd, and I'd just talk to him while he was in there I wasn't sitting on a toilet singing to him reading poetry I was literally out out here talking to him and I think what was weird is seeing him physically decline because he was I'd say he's pretty healthy when I moved in there physically and even mentally he seemed okay he wasn't, you know, he had a, a long history of mental health issues as, such, as I do. But he had, he was, anyone that knew him, especially people around here, they knew him as being this, not a gentle giant, because he wasn't a giant, he was over six foot tall, but he had tattoos, he looked like a, I guess, like a ruffian. Someone that you'd cross the road maybe to avoid. It, you know, this big white scary dog. Um, but he, anyone that got to know him, especially the neighbours, thought he was lovely. He was very respectful, talked gently, and he was helpful. He'd help anyone if he could. He helped me with my shopping. Um, even though, to be fair, he probably physically wasn't up to it, but he still, it got to the point where he would help me do the, sh he helped me carry the shopping uh, out off in the hallway, or he'd bend over and he would take the shopping out of the crates into the bags um, for when I got a delivery. Because my lower back is being. So arthritis in my lower back, and it it hurts so much when I do when I bend over. Which, however weird that might sound, it just does really. So um, he would help with that, but then it got to the point where he wasn't doing so good. So it helped me do it, but I I do it with him. And then it got to the point where I just did it on me. I just, you know, did it on my own. Or I started getting deliveries from Amazon rather than from the supermarket because they just deliver in brown bags. So I can just, and I haven't got to answer the door. It's more expensive, but it's just easier because then I don't have to hurt myself. I'm not in pain when I just, it's like a quick bend and that's it rather than bending over and taking stuff out individually and putting them into carrier bags and all that stuff. Um, one of the worst things is if I bend over the the uh, bath, wash my hair, doing it that way, sometimes I've got hours of pain afterwards. <laughs> See, I managed to turn it back on myself now. Let's talk about me now. Oh dear, oh dear. So... I've been thinking about him recently. Uh, maybe it's because the anniversary's coming up. You know, it's not far off now. It's less than a month away. And just... This is kind of the period when he was pretty much at his worst. The last six months were the worst. And there was, I tried to get him help. I really tried. And 
the you know the he he wouldn't that's the whole thing what I was saying earlier is the expectation that somebody needs to not only ask for help themselves but need to take responsibility for themselves and you know what not everyone can do that sometimes that's part of the illness is not being able to take responsibility for themselves so to just cut those people out you know well we're not going to offer help if you can't you know you've got to turn up for these appointments you've got to do this and do that and he couldn't leave the house because of his stomach you know to the last well not anywhere not any kind of a distance it, I mean I won't go into details but it was really bad his stomach was really really bad I've never known anyone with a worse stomach than that and he'd, he'd given up he completely given up because he didn't know what to do because he couldn't get help for his physical stuff he couldn't not unless he actually went out the house and turned up which he all I could offer was going with him getting a taxi and getting there but even the taxi journey wasn't guaranteed he'd make the taxi journey he wouldn't um got into a psychiatrist a couple of times again in the taxi his leg went septic shortly before he died don't know what that was about and that that lasted for about six weeks and in the end he wouldn't go i say septic it it's, this is not an official diagnosis but it was really bad and it was like he just had a hole in his leg and he we went to the he wouldn't go to the doctors because of his stomach he wouldn't go he couldn't trust himself to get there and i said well we've got to do something so in the end i called 111 and uh they said well what you can you need to go to the hospital really so we can call an ambulance he said no no ambulance okay because he even though he was unwell he had that he still had that civic responsibility of not wanting to waste resources or to take ambulance resources paramedics away from someone else that may need it more than him and as far as he was concerned everyone needed it more than him depending on his mood of course but he didn't want an ambulance the only time he ever had an ambulance for him was when I called it or when I was with him I mean other people called ambulances for him as well during the period that I knew him um, which I found out later but this is you know when he was here when he was with me he never ever called an ambulance for himself wouldn't do it regardless of how he was he wouldn't do it so with the uh, the pharmacy his leg I called 111 and because he wouldn't go to do anything I said well they said well your last option is go to the pharmacy and they, I think they contacted the pharmacy and said that he's going to give you he'll going to look at your leg and he's going to give you medication uh, antibiotics for your leg and if that doesn't work then you will have to call an ambulance or you know get to the hospital so that's what we did we went to the hospital we went to the we got um, a taxi I got a taxi to take him to the pharmacy and I it was quite funny actually because he was he went in there got seen because they've got, they got a special room that you can go into he was 
and he went in there it's quite and they were busy and he, he gets on really well with the pharmacist like the bloke that runs the place and he's known him for years and he just gets on with him but he goes in there but the pharmacist was rude like oh this is not a good time can't you come back when we're not busy unless it's important and I, was, and I shouted yeah it's important mate like the, you know what I mean he needs to be seen the the, the 111 called you up didn't they he said oh well, that was you was it apparently they didn't give the name of the person that they were talking about uh, he said okay uh, and he, I think they were they were really busy I think maybe they were given Covid jabs or something I don't know flu jabs so he went in there and the pharmacist looked at his leg and said okay I didn't go in with him which I did I've been in that's another thing I used to do I used to go into the doctor's surgery with him like for years and years leading up to last year I'd go in with him whether it was for his physical or whether it was for his mental health I'd support him with that and I'd go in with him um, not if he needed an exam uh, like a physical you know intrusive examination I wouldn't be in there with him I'd wait outside but I'd always go with him to the hot, for the doctors always go sometimes we'd go by bus or get a taxi there um, quite often yeah if it was just like a routine thing we'd go by bus and I'd wait outside in the outbit with his dog and then perhaps we'd go and get McDonald's and stuff or then go home so depending I'm talking about like previous years I mean he couldn't he couldn't eat McDonald's the last year or two anyway but yeah so but there were times when I'd go in so if it was something like mental health wise I'd go in with him would leave a dog at home I'd go in with him and it was more to remind him of what he needed to say because he'd forget he'd get distracted a little bit like me really he'd get distracted and start talking about something that wasn't even relevant to why he was there and it's not his fault it's just the way he was and that's always the way he was like he he, he would just talk on about other stuff and he'd I guess try and make them laugh and you know he wouldn't present himself in, in the way that what was really going on with him he'd put a put a like a smiley face on and he'd try and make them feel better even though he'd gone to, to the doctors because of his own being unwell situation so I'd have to bring him back so like hey guys interrupt remember this 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 and he's oh yeah okay just like remind him why he was there and I think in those situations it's important I mean I went into a into the mental health thing with him where he was seeing a psychiatrist with the after he'd had the crisis team called out so I managed to get in there with a taxi again. He wouldn't go. We had let's just, no, not a taxi. We got a car. A local person gave us a lift. It took two of us to get him in there. Not physically, but just he didn't want to go. And we, he was like, "Oh wait a second, I'm gonna do this." And like, we both had to be at him in order to get him into the car. We got in there. I went in with him. The other bloke just waited in his car or drove off and did something and came back so we were in there for about an hour and a half and I was sitting there and again he kept going off the subject so he wasn't given a true account of what was going on and it was hard because if if, it, if this psychiatrist had seen what he was really like at home or when he was up here then I think he would have 
gotten the help that he needed. But then, I don't know, because we called a crisis team out probably six months before he passed. And they wouldn't, they came out, but they wouldn't take him into hospital. And that's what he needed, that's what he wanted. And trust me, he didn't, the idea of him wanting that, he'd had it before in the past, quite a long time ago. He'd been in a mental health uh, unit and he wanted to go back. He wanted to go in because he knew that he felt that either he was going to do harm to someone else or to himself. He really believed that and he needed to be stopped. He needed help and they wouldn't do anything other than give him an appointment in two weeks time to see a psychiatrist. He needed help there and then. And that day he'd already tried to end things himself. So this wasn't just a, you know, it wasn't a call, it was not a shout for help because it failed. And to this day we still don't know if that's what, what happened with him this time. And there's no way of knowing. Because he'd attempted it many times. I've called an ambulance at least three times in the past when he's overdone it, let's say, on purpose. So, uh, I mean, why did, even once the, the paramedics, the first thing he said to the paramedics is, when they brought him back, he said, I don't want a beer anymore. Why wasn't he sectioned? That's the very first thing he said to them. And so it's obviously on purpose, yet they didn't do anything. It's on their camera, him saying that, because they all, all got cameras on there. Why didn't they, it's, although the paramedic said you need to come to hospital and he refused, and the paramedic at that time said, well, next time we won't resuscitate you in your house. We'll take you into the ambulance and we'll resuscitate you on the way to the hospital. But then, how do they do that? Because they needed two people. So it's kind of a, it's a difficult situation, I guess. Because they couldn't stick him in the back of the the ambulance with just one person because it, it took both of them working on him to bring him back. Uh, from, oh, do you know there's a, oh, it's not cute, but it's some stupid term that the drug addicts use. So when someone overdoes it, they say, He's gone over. He's gone over. Like it's... Like just use the proper words. I know I'm not using the proper word when I say overdone it. But I'm trying to keep it as minimum as possible to using those words. I'd never heard that term before until I moved in here. And I, I just... It's such a ridiculous term. He's gone over. I mean, I understand, like, they say it and everyone knows what it means... Use the proper term. Shout it out loudly. Let everyone know what's going on. Instead of keeping it your little secret. You know, maybe a medical person will hear. And they'll be able to actually help, you know. Because let's face it. If you've got five people off their heads. And one collapses. They're very lucky if they actually survive. In that environment. I actually know, this is ridiculous, I, I phoned someone up once, so someone overdosed in my flat. They just went into the toilet, I said the word, sorry. They went into the toilet, their boyfriend was downstairs with my friend. They would had an argument, and she came up here, said, is it okay if I just wait here for a minute, and I'm just going to, I'm going to go and uh, get a taxi. I said, all right, I'll walk you to the taxi. I'll walk you to the petrol station or whatever. So she came in, chatted a bit. I said, let's go. Walked her to the taxi. taxi. She got a taxi, came back. 
And then about an hour later, she turns up again, knocks on my door. I figure it's my friend downstairs. It's not. She comes in. Oh, she was all upset. I'm like, what's going on? Oh, can't find my boyfriend or whatever. They're not answering the door downstairs. Whatever it was, drama. She said, can I come and stay sitting here for a little bit? I said, yeah, it's fine. It wasn't. I used to be up late at night anyway at that time, so it probably was early hours. So she just sat in a chair, the other side of the room, and she said, can I, can I use your toilet? I said, yeah, fine. And I'm wondering, like, are you going to go? When are you going to go? And uh, she went to the toilet, and she came out. She sat on the chair and just slid off the chair and collapsed on the floor, vomited, and like, oh, my God, what the hell is going on here? I did not know that she had taken anything. I didn't know. She didn't like say, I want to go and, you know, no, nothing like that. Because I'd have said, no, get out. So I called an ambulance straight away. I had to do mouth to mouth. I had all this stuff on the phone before the ambulance gets here. And the paramedics are working on her and when they do get here, the police come round because it's a single a woman with with a man. I guess they were suspicious about my activities, so they came in and started searching the flat, just looking around. And so that was that was a pretty horrible experience. So I phoned up a neighbour, not my friend, but someone else, to ask for help. This was um, probably just before I called for an ambulance. Like it's like instantly, like what? Can you help? Because that person would probably know how to help her. Just to, you know, while we wait for the ambulance, his response was, "Let her die." So that's very hard to deal with that. That, that kind of because you know there was another person that I know local or that around or whatever overdosed and two people in a room said just let's just drag them outside and leave them out there because they didn't want the ambulance and the police coming around my friend resuscitated him but there's that a lot of reasons I guess why people die and pass away because an ambulance is not called either they don't don't do anything or they try and do it themselves and they're not medically trained probably most of them to do that because I've seen I've seen that your paramedics spend 40 minutes working on someone to resuscitate them it's not just a simple you know, chest compressions, mouth to mouth. It's a lot, a lot of drugs pumping into them to get them back. You know, oxygen and all that stuff that a human being, a normal person does not have. It was, uh, so to have that, there's also that idea like, oh, just let him, let him, let him die. And, Is I can't get my head around that mentality. So it just shows you what a dangerous situation it is being in a room with people like that. If you know, and they've all got mental health issues, and you know someone's in that environment and you can't help them, they're not going to stop being in that environment. How do you help them? I went through a period when I'd, I got involved in that environment and I'd be there, sitting there with these people. And it wasn't fun. There was nothing fun about it because it was volatile. And I got on with most of his friends. I did, but some of them were just not the nicest people. How many of them really had his 
had his, you know good intentions towards him how many people had his back how many people really cared about his well-being maybe they all did but how many really he told me this is two days before he died he told me that he phoned up two of his closest people in his life and they both said the same thing to him that they got they both said to him they got their own problems to deal with that's what he told me he found out two different people and both got 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 my own problems maybe not the day before but like you know within a week or so before because this was going on for a while and people were just telling him that they got their own problems and which they probably did they definitely did however it's a hard situation to be in isn't it how do you deal with your own stuff when you've got someone else constantly trying to use you as a support system when you're struggling to support yourself it's just a it's a it's a no-win situation i think it's very difficult i can see different sides i can see different sides and it's hard it's just hard so you can't i, I think try to learn and i think i've learned that you can't make someone else do anything. You can't make someone else better. I mean, I'm not a doctor. I'm not a physician um, or a magician. I don't know how to heal someone from their disease or from their mental illness. And no matter how much I'd like to, I can't. I can't do it. I don't know how to. I don't know how to stop someone who's bipolar from being bipolar. If I did, then I wouldn't be bipolar, would I? Because there's very little benefit. I mean... I suppose the benefits would be when I'm in a good mood. When I'm in a good mood, that mood's better than anything. Like anything, there's no nothing can touch it. You know, when I'm in a when I'm in that mood, that mode of like, yeah, buzzing kind of yeah, everything's brilliant. Every, not everything, but you know, but then I can be in that mood at the wrong times. Like at the complete inappropriate times. And I can also be in a hugely depressive mood at the wrong times. I've attended weddings when I just hated everything that was going on. And it wasn't because of what was going on, it was just because of my mood. I've been to a funeral when I was in a good mood. And I was looking around like, why is everyone upset? Oh, I was so... It's almost like I couldn't relate at all to what was going on. And I was like, even almost slapping myself. Well, why can't I get upset about this? Well, this is a long time ago, but not so recent thing. This is 20 odd years, 30 years ago. But I was like, why, why aren't I able to be upset? But it wasn't that I wasn't able to be upset. It's just that was the mood I was in. I was in a good mood. And it wasn't dependent upon my environment. Although my environment does... Am I saying that word right? Environment. Environment. It does affect me sometimes, hugely. And stuff that happens affects me. Sometimes in a huge way, in a, a more magnified way than it's helpful. I mean, caring for someone that's unwell. 
I've been unwell and I've cared for someone that's unwell and I would say caring is worse than being unwell. Now I've never been uh, physically in a sense of uh, like serious, serious, serious physical illness, thankfully. But I have had serious mental illness in the past and it comes and goes anyway it's just one of those things that happens regularly but trying to support someone that is ill from my own experience and I've seen it as well watching other people go through it it's there should be there should be medals. I'm not, I don't mean for me, but I'm just thinking about what my my parents went through when. So, my dad, my stepmom, okay, they had both my nan, and so which is my dad's mum and her mum and dad all ill at the same time. Both her parents had dementia. Parkinson's really they were very very unwell needed care um, and my nan needed care but her, she had nurses coming in and stuff and it's one of those things she went we went to my nan's funeral and then my stepmom had to go visit her mum in hospital I think she'd um, I can't remember she yeah she she was in hospital it's like it, there was no let up there was no release there was no relief there was no she, she went from one horrible situation to another worse situation really because that was her own mum, her own person that gave birth to her, who she'd always been, always been very close to, and she'd seen her deteriorate. I mean, my nan was chatty till the end. She was still chatty. She could hardly talk. She couldn't see hardly at all. She pretty much, she was blind. I think she had a tiny little bit of blurry vision. She couldn't hear very well. The last time I spoke to her, I was almost inside her mouth talking to her. Or inside her ear, I don't know. Just, it, it was hard. I had a megaphone right over her ear. It was just very, but she still had a sense of humour. She still had a, a, like, she was still there, you know? Kind of. But... I knew it was near the end with her. But then, the song's 96. It's quite an obvious statement, isn't it, really? I know some people live to be 107, but that's like the oldest person in the world out of, what, 7 billion people. It, getting to 107 is not a regular occurrence these days. It will be one day, probably, you know, in the future, people will probably live to be hundreds of years old, just like whales do. Maybe we just need to. Maybe that's what it is. We need to put more weight on. Maybe it's the. It's once you get really big, it's unhealthy. But if you get really big, like five, ten times bigger than that, then it it becomes healthy again. Maybe that's why whales do so well. And you have to live in the sea. The problem is we're living on land. The really big people have to live in the sea. And we just have to learn to gradually hold our breath a little bit longer. <laughs> I don't know. Because it's not like they've got gills. They're not fish, are they? They're not in the sea because they, they like to swim. They're in the sea because they couldn't live in any other environment. So maybe that's where us big... I say us, you know. I'm not slim. 
So maybe bigger people need to be. I have lost weight though, so maybe I am slim now. I'm not, but maybe I am, but I'm not. Okay, that's that done. So, yeah. It's, n none of this has probably made any sense at all. I've probably flip-flopped all around the place, but hey, that's what I do. I just wanted to... Just... I was asked to talk about the subject. Here's me talking about the subject. And I would suggest remembering that you're a human being. The question is, you know, about even if you're not an actual carer for the person, it's someone that you care about. If it's your brother, your sister, your relative or good friend, you might not be a personal one-on-one -on -one carer and you might not be with them regularly every day but if you care about them and if you've done what you can do or what you're able to do because you know there's limitations I was in a position with my friend downstairs that he relied on me But if he hadn't relied on me, he might not have. Uh, if I didn't live here, I had his key. I had his front door key upstairs. So I could go in there if I needed to. If he didn't answer his phone or he didn't answer his door, I would go in and just check if he was okay. It didn't happen very often. But he, you know, I did have his front door key up here uh, in an emergency. Or if he, if he lost his keys or if he left his keys somewhere, which he did sometimes. He'd turn his phone off. So people that lived in London or other parts of the country couldn't contact him at all. I'd get people phoning me. Can you check up on him? Is he okay? I said, no, it's fine. He was up here 10 minutes ago. He's okay. Or if I hadn't heard from him, I'd go down and say, uh, you know, are you all right? And someone called. Sometimes I'd keep them on the phone if it was someone that was like his dad or someone, you know, a close person to him. And he talked to them on my phone. And I'd be waiting there for an hour while he was talking to them. Like, can you just turn your phone on and call them back? Um, sometimes he just wanted to, he wanted the company, I think. He used to say to me, you know, half an hour of me is what he needed every day. He felt better if he spent at least half an hour up here with me. It was kind of like a healing thing, you know, just he, he felt better about the day, it put him in a better mood and in, because it was, up here is very relaxing, a relaxing space, it's very calm, always has been and that's how I live my life, I'm so calm, there's no drama, I've seen, I've had people try and be dramatic up here, so I had two people who didn't necessarily get on with each other. One was already in here. Another one knocked on the door. I said, come in. I didn't know they had an issue with each other. So the one that just came in started on the other one. And I just said, no. No. It ain't happening in here. And he didn't know what to say. Like, well, tough. It ain't happening in my home. You get on or you get out. Simple as that. And he left, <laughs> to be fair. He did leave. And I said, no, I'm not having... Because he literally just straight away started and he started grabbing him. I said, no, 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 no. Because I don't do drama. I don't want it in my home. And I've had enough of it in my life. But unfortunately, although it wasn't in my home, it was in the building. So much drama. The last nine years, more drama than anyone ever should have to have without choosing it it's different if you choose that lifestyle and drama comes with it you know if you're going to spend all your days drinking alcohol or taking drugs you're going to have drama there's going to be a chaotic lifestyle drama is going to come your way because you're going to be around people that have dramatic lives 
it just comes with a territory. I don't want that driver. I don't want that lifestyle. And I've never been anti-drugs in my life. I got I got no issue. I had an alcohol. I pretty much had an alcohol problem. Um, in my thirties, you know, kind of I was drinking quite heavily regularly for years. Uh, I stopped, but it was definitely an issue. And I've lived in a house full of alcoholics as well, and I've seen that. I got on with most of them. And I've seen the dramas and all the stuff that goes on there. And ironically, that was during the year when I stopped drinking. I moved into this place and I was surrounded by alcoholics. And I was almost like becoming their carers, helping them. And it was weird, very surreal, very kind of karmic moment, I think. And... I don't want that drama in my life anymore. And I never did, to be honest. I was always like a secret, I used to call myself a secret lemonade drinker after that advert. I'm a secret lemonade drinker. So it wasn't that I was a secret drinker hiding it from anyone. I was just a solitary. Whatever I did in my life, whether it was alcohol or anything else, it was solitary, pretty much. Because I'm a solitary person and I don't, I enjoy myself better when I'm on my own. If I'm doing things than if I'm with someone. I, not with it, I, I, there's a couple of people I've been able to, where I used to have a smoke, I'd do it with two of my friends. Andre was one and we experimented a little bit with different things and he, he was someone that I trusted, Andre, and my other friend as well. Uh, so, not the one downstairs, but it's, this is back in the, the 90s. So, I'm not, I'm not a prude, and I'm definitely not anti, never been anti. Uh, I'm anti the lifestyle for me. I've always been anti that lifestyle for me. Did never wanted that. It scared the hell out of me. Uh, I saw documentaries when I was in my teens of people, you know, with that lifestyle, and I, I was like, "That's my worst case scenario." And I ended up living in that environment partly. So it's weird that it kind of came to me anyway. But never again. I'm never gonna. I can't be involved in any of that stuff. I absolutely detest drugs now. Um, I don't detest people that take them because I still know people that do. And someone, someone did ask me, <clears throat> excuse me, someone did say to me, well, why did you, don't you just stop talking to people that take drugs? I said, well, then I'd have no one to talk to. Everyone I know pretty much does stuff so that's their choice but it's not my they don't do it in my home they don't do it in front of me and I I don't want anything to do with that aspect of anyone's life anymore because I've seen it well I've seen what it's done I've lost someone close to me because of that stuff so yeah not my thing but everyone can do what they want to do. It seems that I've I've noticed that. Yeah, I don't know. It's weird. I don't know if anything I said has made any sense at all. It's a very serious recording. But the bottom line is, try not to. Give yourself a hard time because you can't control what anybody does. You can't control it. Whether you're a parent, whether you're a child of a parent doing something, whether it's your friend, your siblings, your partner, your wife, your husband, you can't 
ultimately stop someone from doing what they're going to do. You can't stop them. You can help them to stop, but you can't actually force someone to stop doing something. It's just, it's kind of impossible. Some people, you know, they can be manipulated in a sense of, uh, I knew someone that he met someone and she said, she didn't know that he was doing stuff. And she said, if you, if you don't stop doing that, then we can't be together because she'd lost her brother to that stuff. And he did stop. But that was his choice to stop. He chose her over getting high. And so that was his choice. And there are millions of people that have stopped. Millions of people that have stopped drinking alcohol. Millions of people. The thing is, I think the alcohol... I would say the alcoholics, just using that as a term, they've got the right idea, is you go to AA and you continue forever to monitor the whole thing and you support each other. And I know there is NA, Nar Narcotics Anonymous, but it doesn't seem to be the same. It's from what I've seen people... I've known people in AA that have gone on to be have a really good lives, really good, successful, happy lives. And, you know, they've always classed themselves as alcoholics, even 30, 40 years later. You won't, you, you'll be, you'll struggle to find someone calling themselves a drug addict when they've just literally just injected something 10 minutes ago. You know, it's the face in it. It's the the actual face in the issue. It's one of those things. It's just... Maybe it's the lack of support. Maybe it's the lack of caring as a society. Uh, there's definitely a... A negative... Negativity, I think, towards people that are in that world, you know, that are doing that stuff. And I understand why. I understand why. I can see why. Um, I'll, be, I'll be honest. I was more compassionate about people with drug issues before I met them. Honestly, I've met them as in like I used to counsel people and. Uh, you should do relaxation sessions in 2006, 2007. But once I started to spend time, like, seeing what goes on, uh, I kind of, I, I had less compassion as a whole. I had more compassion individually for my friend. But the reality was just like, Wow. Because the only people I was seeing at this drug and drug rehab center were people that had actually, had actually stopped, and they were getting their lives back. It wasn't like a, a turning up for a quick session and then going out and doing drugs. It's like they were they literally had stopped and they were serious. Some of them were really ill and they they couldn't do anything anymore. And even the counsellors had previously been addicts, some of them. So it was, it was a very successful place. So I guess I'd only seen the nice side of it, if that makes sense. The after, the recovery side, not the the Ill, illness side of it. And... But there was one person at the charity and he used to come in and he was so ill. But just from the after effects of all of it, his body was just falling apart. But he still came in every week to do the relaxation session and he loved it. 
and it's the only time that he stopped shaking because his nervous system was completely messed up. Uh, I'm not quite sure what he had, but he had some quite serious illness that was happening because of his uh, previous lifestyle. And the one thing I noticed about every single one of them, not every single, but most of them, is they were nice. I was going to say every single one. There was some that were actually in prison and they just came out for the, for the uh, part of their treatment. Like day release to come to the centre and not all of those were so friendly. But I made a mistake. I didn't realise. So, so I did this course and I was helping run another thing, which was talking about anger management and stuff. This is with the boss who ran the place. I was just supporting him. He got called out. And the idea was well, I was going to support him. And then at the end, I was going to do a relaxation session. So he'd do like half an hour talking. And I'd do half an hour relaxation session. And it was full. A full group. Probably 20 people. Adults, men. And he had to rush off. And I said, okay. An emergency. A family emergency. So I said, uh... When he'd gone, they said, "Do we have to be?" Here? I said, "No, of course you don't." I didn't know who they. I didn't know why they were there or who they were. I was. No one told me that they were all people that were in prison. And he, I said, "We can do a relaxation session." I said, and they said, "Oh, do you, someone shouted out, do we need to be?" Here? I said, "No, go if you don't want to be here, go." And probably at least eight people left. And. <laughs> And the next week, I got told not to say that again. And a couple of them had a go at me, said, you said we could go, but we weren't allowed to go. I said, I didn't know you was all prisoners. How was I supposed to know that? I didn't know you had to be here. And I said, look, it doesn't work. I'm not doing a relaxation session with people that have to be here. It doesn't work that way. You know, either they, you could, they might have to be here for what you're doing, but they have to, it has to be optional for what I do. Otherwise, I'm not doing it. So they, they kind of said, okay, for that for, for my relaxation, only those that wanted to be there could be there. The, the rest could leave. They'd have to still be in the building, but they'd go into a different section. Because so I'm not. Relaxation sessions, it has to be voluntary, you know? Otherwise, it's just going to be disruptive for everyone else. So there I am, I talked for about seven hours, I've still got a bit of a headache. Uh, sorry if I've talked complete nonsense for a, an hour and a half, which I probably have and that's probably what I normally do. But I suppose really I'm just trying to get the, the point across is you can only do what you can do and... If someone's set on self-destruction, there's ain't a huge amount you can do to help. You, I don't say ignore it and don't help. Just still, still try to help, but just remember it's not your fault, right? It's not your fault. It's not my fault. My friend's dead. It's not your fault. If someone's going through. Uh, an illness, whether it's mental health or physical, uh, you can't control another person. We don't have that right. The only time we get to do that is if we've got kids. And even then, there are laws surrounding that. I know a lot of people think the law don't apply to them, but it really does. So children have a lot more rights now than they ever used to. But ultimately... You can't control another adult. You can't physically control them. You can't mentally control them. You can try and emotionally control them if you're in a relationship with them. That sometimes works. But they probably won't like you for it. Uh, so yeah, it may well backfire as well. You know, the whole thing, stop drinking, otherwise you're not going to see your kids anymore. Well, that's probably just going to drive them to drink even more. 
even heavier. So it's kind of like trying to work out what the right the right way around it is. And I don't have an answer for that. That's the problem. I wish I did. I don't. I don't know what the solution is other than you do your best. And your best one week might not be your best a different another week. You might not be able to do anything one week because you're not able to deal with it. Yeah, unless you're a qualified carer, which, I mean, there's lots of qualified carers, there's a lot in the world, but probably more people caring are unqualified than doing it because they've kind of got no choice. Because it's a member of their family or, you know, something like that. And nothing's ever going to be good enough. But whatever you do is good enough. Just remember it is good enough. But it might not be good enough to them. And it might not feel good enough to you. But ultimately it is good enough. Because if you're doing your best, you're giving what you can give. It is good enough. Even, you know, I know it's like, I'm just contradicting what I'm saying. Even if it isn't good enough, it's still good enough. You've done what you can. You're not an alchemist, you know, you're not a magician. You do what you can. And maybe it's time to realise that you're pretty amazing. The fact is, you care. If you care about someone and you care about their well-being, even if you don't, even even if you're not with them, then doesn't that say something about you? The fact that you care. Maybe just let them know that you care. That sometimes. It's all you can do. You might live in a different country. You know, it's, it was easy for me in a sense. He lived downstairs. It was 10 second journey. It, I say easy, but like as far as um, getting there, travel wise, I mean. Sometimes just a text message letting you know that I care I do care and say it say it, to, say it to the point where they're annoyed sometimes and that that's when you know it's starting to sink in I just want to know you, I care about you yeah yeah no I, bloody I care about you I really care about you yeah yeah, yeah I really care and they're getting annoyed but you know what what are they going to remember when you've left when you've gone and they're thinking about what you said it's annoyed them but what are they thinking about? They're hearing the words, I care about you. I care about you. I love you, or whatever way you want to put it. I care about you. So they might be annoyed with that. Just stop going on. But I care, I just want you to know I care about you. It's important. I'll do anything I can to help you, and I care about you, and I am here. And only offer that if it's real, if it's true as well. If you can be there for someone. If you can't be there for someone all the time. Don't tell them you can. Because it's not fair on either of you. Some people do have the ability to be there. For someone. In an emergency. Because either they live locally. Or you know they live with the person maybe. But if you're not able to be there. You can at least. Basically say I wish I could be there for you. All the time. But I am thinking about you and I do care about you deeply. Sometimes that it just, because it's real, it's true. Rather than, well, I'm always here if you need me. Well, that's not true, is it, necessarily? It might be, but it might not be. And I've said that to people and it's not been true. But with him it was true. Because I always I was always here to answer the door if he knocked. I was always here. I'll answer the door if people knock anyway, but 
I'll always, I never, he was always welcome to come in. Or if he needed me to go down, he would. Sometimes he'd shout out from the garden. Sometimes he'd shout from his flat and I'd go down, but that wasn't that often. But I've never been able to do that for anyone else. And I don't know if I'll ever be able to do it again for anyone else. Because I, I don't know if I could put myself through that again. But when I said to him, I am here and I do care. He didn't question it because he knew. That's the one thing he knew. That I was here. And he knew and he, and he, he used to thank me. And I used to say, look, don't thank me. Just pay me the bloody money back that you owe me. And he'd laugh. And I'd think, why are you laughing? I want that bloody money back. <laughs> and he'd laugh again because I'd say that. He said, no, seriously, pay me my money. Um, so tell you what used to made him laugh when I lost it. Occasionally I'd get angry. Occasionally. Not at him, but potentially, but... Just something would trigger me. I'd really lose it. It's very rare for that to happen to me. But he'd find it funny. Because he always saw me as this gentle person. And he was like, oh, I wouldn't want to upset you. It's like, what are you talking about? Because he really, just because I, I perhaps not, it's a bit weird. But it used to make him laugh though. And that's another thing I miss. We had the sense of humour where we both say things that are very inappropriate, but it was very funny. And there's just certain things that he'd, he'd do to... I'll give you an example of him. In a, in a, some of the things he'd say. So he was sitting, we were watching... I don't know if we were watching boxing, but he was sitting on a chair over there. I was sitting in my chair at the desk. Another person came in and he was sitting on the, the settee. He said to me, do you mind if I smoke a joint? I said, I don't care. Windows open. I'm not bothered. Uh, I've not been near that stuff for years and it was proper pungent. He went, so my friend was still sitting over there. The one with the joint, put his, he said, I was going to pop to the toilet. Is that all right? I said, yeah, fine. My friend said to me, you got to ask him to get rid of that. That smoke's disgusting. It's really making me gag and it's getting on my chest and it's horrible. I said, I agree, it is horrible. He said, can you just ask him? Ask him to put it out, please. So I said, uh, when he came back, I said, oh, you, I suppose you could do us a favour. Could you not smoke that here because it smokes a bit too much? And uh, you know what my friend, the other friend said? My friend. He said, oh, it's not bothering me. The first thing he said, and he looked at me. And he's just like, he smiled and laughed without laughing, just with his eyes. That's how he was, very cheeky, very, um, just, yeah, it was funny. It was, and as I still, I did tell, I didn't tell the person that, that had the joint, I didn't tell him at the time, but I told him after the event, after, after my friend passed away, and he, he, he found it funny. He said, like I say, that is exactly what he's like. That is just, it's just a wind up, really. Oh, dear. So I'm going to go, but I don't know if any of this was useful or worth it. If it wasn't, I'm a, I apologize. If it was, I apologize. <laughs> I apologize to everyone for everything. Because, uh, anyway, I'm going to go. Thank you for listening. Remember to be kind to yourself because you do deserve to be happy. Be gentle with yourself. Lots of love. And remember, all you can do is your best and your best is enough. And that's Woken Vinny up. Bye. All right then. You just woken up. Just as we were doing that, you just woke up. It's like he's primed to hear me say bye or all, all the best, lots of love, and he just wakes up. All right, I've got to do wee wee. Let's do wee wee then.
relax in a more deep and meaningful way maybe in a way that can not just allow you to feel calmer now and throughout the time we spend together here not just relaxed at the end of the recording when it's finished and you can enjoy that sense of comfort and peace but also I think it would be nice to have those feelings of relaxation continue for longer after the recording is ended so that you can still benefit from listening to my voice maybe in a few hours time perhaps tomorrow And then by listening regularly, especially if you find, like some people do, and myself as well, I, sometimes I find one particular recording that really resonates with me. And I just listen to it over and over again, like every morning, every evening. There was this recording from, we're going back to about 1999. It, was a, it wasn't hypnosis, but it was a guided visualization. So it kind of was hypnosis, really. And I managed to find it again. And it still has the same effect on me. And part of it was... person's voice relaxed me just felt so peaceful and I'd look forward to listening to her in the morning and in the evening And I knew before even pressing the play button that as soon as I'd done that, pressed the play button, this was in the days of CD players, press the play button. In fact, it might have even been a tape, tape recorder. I'd lie down on the bed and then even without necessarily listening to her words because I had them memorized really. It was as if my body knew exactly what to do. And the muscles just almost went into automatic relaxation.
and I remember my mind would slow down. Now, now, I was, I was listening to this recording in the early days of learning hypnosis and long before I ever made any videos or audio recordings myself because I didn't start doing that till 2006. But I knew, I knew how helpful I found being able to just let go, to have that trust in the person that I'm listening to. knowing that it's going to be just as relaxing if if not more so each time you hear my voice you may feel the same some people have been listening to me for over a decade. Maybe not solidly, obviously not 24 hours a day, but maybe people come back. Some people maybe listen every day. And something that I do, which you may not realize by listening, is when I record these recordings, now for example, I also am affected by the words that I say. So if I said to you, focus on your feet, notice your feet relaxing. I will be focusing on my feet. I will be noticing my feet relaxing. If I said focus on your hands and maybe notice the difference between each hand. Perhaps notice the, the air in the room, the temperature of the room on the backs of your hands. You may start to notice what almost feels like a very light breeze, even though they're may not be any type of breeze at all where you are right now. And as you become aware of your hands, I'm also aware of how 
relaxed my hands are feeling now. comes to potentially drifting off to sleep, which may be the reason you're listening. I also feel drowsy when I make these recordings. I also notice my mind drifting. In fact, at times, I've actually fallen asleep. Without even noticing. And then I carry on talking. It's only when I listen back to do the editing, I hear snoring. And I think, I don't remember snoring. I remember talking. Was it snoring or was a pig turned up? That's what I sound like when I snore. And I get really into the whole experience. I don't know how you feel. How relaxed you feel in your feet. How relaxed you feel in your hands. I have noticed more and more that the more relaxed deeper level of comfort you feel the easier your breathing becomes It's almost like that additional muscle relaxation. So this allows you to breathe easier. without necessarily focusing on your breath. However, being able to notice ease in which you breathe so naturally you 
breathe so very easily and smoothly. My breathing improving when I've got my eyes closed. I tend to visualize beautiful field with trees and flowers producing all that life-giving oxygen. Feels nice. To, if nothing else, just taking some time away from everything. Enjoying that feeling of peace, serenity. a joyful heart time seems to just Drip by so very slowly. Peaceful. Completely. Unattached. To any thought. whatsoever in this moment completely free
Noticing that. Your mind. Has slowed down. Because nothing really requires your attention. You can enjoy physical sensations of allowing the stress to drip out of your body. Drip in out of every part of your body. And being released from your brain and your mind. Slowly but surely the muscles in your legs Pleasant feelings in your arms and shoulders. Deepening each part of your body. Further and deeper and deeper. No 
to soon. The feelings in the back of your neck. Feelings in your wrists. Muscles in the front of your body, are also feeling. Deeply There's a sense of peace spreads through your very core. Even when you focus on your mind, your mind becomes even slower. Very slow. Your stomach. Peaceful in your stomach. Your back. Do 
this. Notice how relaxed you now feel. all of your back. Your spine. your brain all the way down the middle of your back, sending and receiving millions of messages every day. Deeply relaxed. Spreading those signals down your spinal cord into every part of your body. Your shins and your calf muscles. Feelings of peace and tranquility spreading through your body. Tips of your toes to your eyes, your fingers. all the way to your lower back. Letting go. Really letting go.
was wandering away. Happy to let go. Let go. So tranquil, your whole body. Joy in a sense of letting go. Even more. Enjoying the space, this space of peace and safety.
letting go. Maybe we can just focus on the different parts of your body, just to notice forehead and your eyes, So loose. Noticing a sense of Complete freedom. Absolute freedom.
not have noticed. Your mind drifting. Peaceful. Blissful peace, blissful peace. Go.
body feels almost invisible. you could start to notice that you are feeling more relaxed even though I've not purposely focused your mind upon that sense of physical comfort that is growing within you throughout your body and your mind starts to slow down and that could be almost in recognition of I guess my speech not being particularly fast and things just generally feel calmer just by listening to my voice you give yourself a, an opportunity to take a break from the day take a break from your life as it is and to give yourself a rest giving yourself permission to take some time off and to allow your body to relax and allow your mind to slow down which in turn releases the tension any stresses that you had in your body almost as if the parts of your body just open up allowing the negativity out and at the same time replacing that negativity with positive healing energy which then fills your body up and your mind to also starts to appreciate those feelings of increasing confidence and an almost uplifting feeling positive healing an energy that spreads through your body like a wave of comfort. 
comfort. And all this comes from just allowing yourself a few minutes, maybe half an hour, however long you want it to be, to just rest. And allow your mind and your body to almost reset itself to the, to the settings of comfort and relaxation, calmness, which allows more room for feelings of pleasure and happiness to move around your body and into your mind almost as if your mind and your body are sinking together almost mirroring each other with that growing positivity and calmness and it feels nice it really does feel nice to know that you are the one that has allowed yourself to feel more comfort to experience more of this deep relaxation spreading throughout your body. And as I focus on each part of your body you can notice that that part becomes even more relaxed just by focusing on it. It becomes even more calm and comfortable just by focusing. And as I move down your body, starting at your head, the parts that you've already focused on will continue to relax deeply. And those parts that we've not yet focused on will just automatically Release any remaining tension in anticipation of even more comfort about to come. Now, I'm going to start by focusing on your forehead. Just being aware of the feelings of your forehead. And any background sounds, like Mr. Herbert the Pigeon, can just allow you to feel even more relaxed. It just means you're in the moment. This isn't, this isn't a sterile environment. This is the world. I live in the countryside. So there's lots of nature sounds around. So as you focus on your forehead, just notice how it becomes even 
more relaxed as you focus only on my voice and that part of your body. Moving down to your eyes, focusing on your eyes, noticing eyelids feel so heavy, yet so light at the same time, and all the muscles around your eyes relaxing completely, moving your focus down to your mouth, your lips, your tongue, your teeth and your gums, and the whole of your mouth relaxing, calm and loose as you focus now on your jaw, not just the part of your jaw near your mouth your chin, but all the way up the sides of your face to your ears, that whole of your jaw, feeling more relaxed and calm. in on your neck, the front of your neck and your throat, relaxing and loose and calm, the sides of your neck, the right and left side of your neck. Focusing on the back of your neck, letting go of any tension that may have been there before, and enjoying that sense of increasing comfort and release you can experience in the back of your neck, moving down your back, moving either side of your spine, right from the top of your back, all the way down to the bottom of your back. down to your lower back, as you move up and down your spine, you can feel the muscles either side of your spine relaxing even more. As those muscles relax, that sense of comfort starts to spread outwards from your spine into both sides of your back, the top of your back, the middle and your lower back. And as you scan gently 
gently and slowly up and down your back as the muscles in the top of your back relax and become looser the muscles in the middle of your back also seem to just almost divide from each other separating and almost melting and in your lower back there seems to be an extra special feeling of comfort that spreads into your hips down your lower back and into your hips, into the area where your coccyx are, and into your buttocks, and all those muscles that spread from your lower back into your hip area. Start to melt. Start to really let go. Don't even know we're about to focus on your shoulders, your back, and your spine. We'll continue. As you focus on your shoulders, you may notice that they're already feeling really loose. muscles that move from your neck into your shoulders. Feel so soft and gentle. So smooth. Feeling in your shoulders seems to spread deep into your shoulders. That sense of relaxation, not just traveling deeply into your muscles. Also relaxing the bones, and moving all the way to underneath your arms, relaxing that whole area between the tops of your shoulders and underneath your arms. healing you feel so relaxed and comfortable in your shoulders which sends that deep healing 
message. Into your arms. And you may feel almost as if your arms are not even there. Because they're so relaxed, so deeply relaxed. So, so calm. spreading all the way down your arms to your elbows including your elbows circumference spread Forearms and your wrists, feeling so heavy, yet at the same time, so light and gentle. Now on your hands, sense of real peace it just seems to feel so familiar
fingertips. attention to the front of your body, so comfortable, muscles in your thighs, your knees, so relaxed. Muscles and your shins completely
I'm going to start counting down now from 20 down to 1. You can imagine, in a way, it's like just walking down some steps. And each step, all 20 steps, and each step represents a level of comfort. Each step represents a deepening of that comfort. And the further you, you walk down those steps, the deeper and more relaxed you feel. So, starting with number 20. Twenty. Eighteen. Seventeen.
sustain. Fourteen. Thirteen.
six.
as you focus on your eyes. We're going to count down from ten down to one. Focus in just on your eyes. your eyelids, the muscles around your eyes, your eyeballs themselves, the whole area that makes up your eye. And as we count down from ten, to focus in on your eyes. You'll become twice as relaxed with each number counting down. And you may find sleep and if that's what you want then just allow yourself to do that now focus in on your eyes I'm going to begin counting down from ten to one right now ten
so counting down from ten to one ten nine eight seven six five four three two one and maybe that was a bit too quick in order to relax maybe it's a bit too fast for you to notice the calming of your body maybe even a little bit of pressure there like you're counting down from 10 to 1 what do you expect me to do man you expect me just to go all floppy just because you're counting down you could try it again but this time I'll go a bit slower this time and you focus on the whole of your body before we focus on your legs just notice how your body does start to feel more relaxed with every number that I count down 10 Seven, six, five, four. just notice how how you feel generally how your body feels it's not necessarily even about counting down from 10 to 1 it's that space that you have that space between being active physically or mentally to just sitting or lying down and just being there not doing anything not saying anything not needing to think think about anything so it, op it opens up a space you know a bit of a space a gap and the more I count down from 10 to 1 the bigger that gap be 
comes. So there's that gap of calmness, of comfort, of relaxation. It's a nice feeling. And it moves those stresses or discomforts physically or emotionally, moves them away. Allows you to just slow down. So I'm going to count again from 10 down to 1 and notice that gap widening. The gap. And as it widens, it's almost like the, the stress and the tension falls into the gap. gives you that distance, that space, now, 10, 9, 7, 6, 5, Three. How does your body feel now? Can you notice the, that you're feeling calmer? Feeling more relaxed. As we now focus on your legs. Just your legs. And we're just going to start with 
focusing on your thighs. Of course, it's not the most exciting thing to be doing because I'm, I'm sure like most of your body there's not a lot going on right now but just focus in on the whole of your thighs the tops of your thighs the sides of your thighs the bottoms of your thighs, your outer thighs and your inner thighs. Basically the whole of your thigh that leads into your hip. And then goes down to your knee joints. Now this is a big area. It's a very heavy area, it's very strong, probably the strongest muscles in your body are in your thighs. But I don't think we perhaps give enough attention to our thighs. Perhaps we don't acknowledge how important our thighs are to our lives. How much they actually do for us. all through our lives. And it may, it may seem, sound really weird, but I think that all of our body parts, especially our thighs, need some TLC. A bit of love shown. A bit of Acknowledgement, a thank you, gratitude for what our thighs do for us. And I know this may sound a bit strange. And maybe you think, why am I? Surely I should be out in in the garden hugging a tree or something well it's hard to set a microphone up on a tree that's why I'm doing this indoors otherwise I would be outside hugging a tree no I can't see the television from the tree if you move down to your knees Gain such an important part. And I think we don't necessarily, I'll speak for myself here, I don't necessarily appreciate all that my knees do for me until I have a problem with my knee. So occasionally, if I have a, maybe I bash it or it's aching for some reason. It's then that I realise how much it does. You know, the benefit of being able to use my legs without any kind of physical discomfort is a beautiful thing that's possibly not appreciated until it's 
temporarily removed, you know, that comfort. But as you focus on your knees, regardless of how your knees feel, you can have that sense of gratitude and love to your knees for all that they do for you. And you can still have that attention on your thighs. Maybe notice how your thighs feel. Maybe you've noticed that they are relaxing more deeply. As you focus now on the bottoms of your legs, the shins, and the calf muscles, the bones between your knees and your feet, incorporating of course your ankles. So important. You know, anyone that's had even the, like the slightest sprain of an ankle knows how how much we take our ankles for granted. And it's kind of strange in a way when you think that. You know, logically, our wrists are a lot thinner than the rest of our arms, which is okay. Doesn't can't see any problem with that because we're just picking stuff up. But our ankles are so much thinner than the rest of our legs. And from a physics perspective. Or logical even, it doesn't really make sense that all this weight would ultimately be resting on your ankles and then leading to your feet. That thin area, thin bone, yet yeah, it does so much great work supports us, supports our body for a lifetime. Helps us to balance. Helps you to get around and be mobile. And there's the calf muscles of course. When I was younger, I couldn't see the point in calf muscles. I didn't seem to do anything. Like, okay, if I walked around on tiptoes, then my calf muscles get some work. But of course, that's not true. The calf muscles are being used whenever we use our legs. And your shins. There to protect your lower legs, shaped in a way almost as a protector for the bone. Leading, of course, to your ankles and your feet. We're not going to focus on your feet, we're just going to focus on the legs. And I realise that now that I've mentioned your feet, you're probably focusing on them anyway. So maybe I should focus on your feet a little bit. You can have them in your awareness. The same as you have your thighs in your awareness even though we haven't been focusing on your thighs 
for a few minutes and you're focusing on your ankles there's still that sensation of comfort in your thighs almost that movement of energy because the thighs hold lots of different sensations of course there's the muscles the big strong muscles that we have in our thighs but the skin on the outside of the thighs as in the outside of all of our body can be very sensitive sensitive to the touch sensitive to temperature and inside your thighs the bones there's the muscle, there's the blood vessels, the arteries, there's all this stuff that's inside your thighs. And I guess sometimes it'd be nice if you could actually put your fingers inside your thighs and massage. So you can massage on the outside, of course, but to be able to get deep into the muscles to be able to just massage inside your thighs, massaging the bones of your leg, massaging all the veins and just gently healing your thighs. And you could move down, massaging inside your knees massaging those bones but with healing fingertips spreading that healing energy deep into the joints of your knees and of course there's the back of your your knee you know the inside crease where your knee is it's a very sensitive area very feels very nice when you stroke it that might be because it's an area that's not really touched very often it's almost like a hidden part that crease in your legs it's almost it's like a part that has a, a sensitivity which is a little bit different it's protected by your legs so you can imagine putting your fingers into that crease in your legs that fold in between your legs you can just massage with your fingertips imagine your fingertips going inside massaging the muscle tissue you can of course feel the, the bones of your knees healing through your fingertips and then as you go down to your calf muscles now that's a part I'd like to be able to really put my fingertips deep inside my calf muscles and massage in every single tissue of that muscle healing every part and then doing 
the same for my shins. Massaging, gently stroking the bones, gently stroking them, healing in a loving way, because they deserve to be treated as the precious bones that they are, because our legs are so precious, as in all the other parts of our body, they're more precious than any jewel on the planet. And when you start to think about your legs in this way, it can change your perspective. It might sound a bit a bit silly to start with the idea of having love for your legs showing appreciation for your thighs wanting to be able to put your hands in your thighs and massage the muscles in the bones and to get your fingers deep in there releasing all tension just to show how much you care about your legs, how much you care for what your legs do for you regularly, your knees, your calves, your ankles, the strength of your ankles, considering how thin they are compared to the rest of your legs, especially your thighs, yet they're so strong, so flexible, absolutely amazing things your ankles are, truly a gift because of what they do for you. Supporting all that weight, regardless of how what weight you are, even if you're only eight stone, still a lot of weight, these little ankles. Now I'm a lot heavier than eight stone. Double that. Yet my ankles support my body all the time. Although they do give off a sigh of relief when I sit down. As in fact my whole legs do. My feet, feet also go my toes clap, I'm so happy. Your legs really are amazing. And I know that talk, uh, talking about your legs is probably, possibly the, one of the most, in, most boring things you've ever heard anyone say, possibly. But boring or not, everything I said is true. Your legs are amazing. Your legs deserve not just respect, they deserve to relax, 
deeply. They deserve to take some time out of the day to just let go completely. Because the legs are so, such a most, you know, very important part of your body, when you relax your legs, the rest of your body also naturally follows in that journey of comfort. feel it in my hips, my hips feel really loose, and also in my lower back as well, my lower back really feels, it feels stretched, even though I'm just sitting in a chair, and there's no stretching, as far as I'm aware that I'm doing, it's almost as if the muscles have just relaxed so much that there is a natural stretch as the tension has reduced a lot. down from 10 down to 1 and you can continue to feel wonderfully relaxed 10 9 8 7 So I'm just going to count down from five down to one. And as I count down, if you just focus on the numbers, just the numbers, counting down, and notice how you feel in this moment as you hear the numbers counting down, knowing that those numbers counting down represents you feeling calmer, not just in your body, but also relaxing your mind. And just notice how you feel. There's nothing to do. There's nothing to say. There's nothing to think about. Starting with number five. Four. Three. One. 
As you notice the gradual letting go of the tension in your body, you may also begin to notice and be aware of how your mind is starting to slow down. This is just a natural thing that happens. It's not really a special procedure. It's just natural because as your body relaxes, your mind also starts to relax. And the more your mind relaxes, the more your body relaxes. It's just a continuous circle of relaxation. And there's that calmness that comes from relative quietness. You know, even even if there's background sounds, either your side or mine, it's still going to be quite calm. You know, you haven't got the television on, there's no music in the background unless you're listening to the recording with music, of course. You're very likely not going to be sitting in a room with other people. Of course you might be, but generally it's more ideal if you can do this on your own. So, no distractions. And when you stop thinking about stuff, relaxation automatically rises. A sense of comfort starts to grow. And without trying to build it up into something fantastical or something magical, this is just a natural process, something that's easy to accomplish. In fact, it's almost you know, the sense of relaxing completely happens really when you put no effort into it. It's not something that you can really force. It's something that happens naturally and part of the process of this recording and others is simply to allow you to take advantage of this space, this time, to just let go, to just be here, to be in tune with how you feel. Yet with the intention of wanting to relax deeply. And maybe even to fall asleep depending on what it is that you wish for yourself in this moment. As we know, relaxing is the majority of the process of falling asleep. The actual falling asleep part is the tiny bit at the end, the deeper relaxed you become, the easier
easier. You find yourself drifting. You can also, if you choose, stay focused on my voice and really enjoy the process of gradually Relaxing each muscle in your body. Effortlessly. And just observing. the sensation of letting go. Completely. This time I'm going to count from six down to one. Notice your mind calming down more with each number you hear me say. Naturally feeling calm and slow and peaceful.
has slowed right down, sinking deeply into relaxation. As you focus on your mind, you may notice that there are some thoughts still there, maybe some stubborn thoughts that for some reason perhaps need your attention. can do is send love to those thoughts, sprinkle those thoughts with love, like little petals from a flower, just sprinkle it over them, petals filled with love towards those thoughts, to let those thoughts know that you're not abandoning them, you just need them, you require them to just calm down, slow down, quiet down. As you focus on those remaining thoughts, as we count down this time from seven down to one, with each number, just imagine sprinkling those flower petals of love, kindness, gratitude over those thoughts. Which will allow them to just melt away and relax deeply. With every number. Those thoughts will become more in with number seven.
Imagine now, notice how relaxed you're feeling in your body. We're going to focus Because the more relaxed your hands are, the more relaxed your body and mind are. And as you focus on your hands and your fingers, there's nothing needed to be done, there's no clenching of fists or tensing the fingers or anything like that, it's just noticing and focusing on your Noticing how they feel. Because the more relaxed your hands feel, the calmer your Noticed that your mind is starting to drift. Just on your hands and fingers, allowing them to experience a real deepening of that relaxation in your hands and fingers. number from eight down to one you can almost feel that healing and relaxing energy spreading into your hands Each 
in again. Starting with number eight. Seven. Just being here now. Nothing to think about. Nothing to do. Nothing to say. And everything just feels calmer. This is your natural state of being. This is how you just normally feel when you take away all of that other stuff that we add. You know, things like stress and worrying and overthinking and 
anxiety, tension. Just generally thinking about stuff. When you take that away, which is what we do, what we do now, sense of peacefulness which comes to you very quickly because ultimately it's just a feeling a feeling of comfort it's almost as if you've gone inside yourself and you've found a special place where everything is peaceful, a place where you can feel relaxed and your natural sense of comfort, a place where you can be you. yourself for who you are, a place where you're not trying to please anybody else, ever, a place where you can actually not just love yourself, but in some ways more importantly, you can like yourself. Appreciate who you are. And that sense of gratitude is in the air all around you. And that's also a place where you feel the healing energy soaking into your body. Healing energy soaking into your body. And that healing energy spreads through your veins. Traveling to each and every single part of your body. And you start to realize that actually that healing energy has not just entered into your brain. It's become part of your brain. spinal fluid is now mixed with healing energy. Not just allowing you to feel so much more relaxed and healthy in this moment, but also you start to realize that actually what's happening now with that healing, relaxing energy spreading through your body is actually changing your life. It's actually changing the way you're going to feel not just now, but tomorrow and the next day, as your health improves, not just your physical health, but your mental health, things 
things that used to bother you in the past, for some reason, no longer have the effect that they used to. Because something has changed deep within you. Maybe things that used to cause you to feel anger no longer have that power to control you the way they seem to be able to before as you realize that you are the one who decides what affects you. You're the one who decides to feel relaxed and calm when you choose to enjoy Noticing these natural developments of healing, continuing to grow and improve your life day by day. Including, of course, your ability to relax so much easier and sleep in is the most natural thing in the world to you because falling asleep is something that you've done so many times in your life and you know that you were born as we all were with the ability to fall asleep naturally you were born with that ability to just drift off into a deep healing sleep. Even when we're kids, sometimes we'll fall asleep when we don't even want to. We try to <laughs> stay awake. Maybe it's a birthday in the morning or it's Christmas or holiday or something we look forward to. We don't want to go to sleep. But the more we want to stay awake, the more we just start to drift. And the more you fight drifting, the more you try and stop yourself from drifting asleep. The deeper and stronger that drifting becomes. Because we're born not just with the need to relax deeply and to naturally fall asleep, but it's our birthright, it's part of our DNA. And sometimes as we get older in life, Perhaps at times we have forgotten that relaxing completely is not only a wonderfully pleasant experience, it's also really easy. It's 
very, very easy to let go. Because that's all it is, it's just deciding to let go. And when you press the play button on my recordings, you have given permission for my voice to relax you. When you press that play button, you have given me permission for my words to affect you in a positive positive way, opening up your mind to useful and healing suggestions that can have such an amazing effect on how you feel right now, as well as those changes that continue long after the recording ends, those changes within you continue to flourish and grow, transforming your life in a positive, beautiful way, allowing you to move forward in your life in the direction that you choose for yourself. And this feeling, this feeling that you can experience of safety, comfort, calmness, This feels so nice. It's such a healthy place to be. And that positivity grows within you. to find that you're more relaxed physically and in your mind is more relaxed. And it's not that you're thinking slower, it's just that your mind will be less clogged up with unnecessary negativity. Because from now on, your mind rejects negativity. From now on, you're going to start noticing when negativity arises. You can just say stop. Stop. And that negativity will 
turn around and leave you alone. Stop. And that negativity would disappear. as you notice that you feel way more relaxed than you probably expected. You can now congratulate yourself because you're the person that has done this. You are the one that has opened your mind up to the simple facts that you can feel more relaxed in your body and in your mind. You've opened your mind up to the birthright of being able to just Fall asleep easily when you choose. And that's a nice feeling, don't you think? Feels nice, doesn't it? To feel calm with all that healing spreading through your body and your mind. To spend time in that, that special place where negativity can no longer enter. Negativity is banned, it's barred, it's not allowed entry. Doesn't it doesn't des- doesn't deserve to be here, doesn't belong here. Negativity has no place in your life. makes room for more comfort, more healing, more relaxation, more peace. Feels nice, doesn't it? To just let go of everything. And I'm going to count down now from twenty down to one. Continue to relax. If you choose, you can drift to sleep with every number you hear me say. You can feel twice as relaxed. Or if you choose, you can feel twice as sleepy. Now, twenty. Seventeen. 
Damn. No. Eight. This is your time to just take a break. Your time to relax, to allow your mind to slow down. To give yourself permission to take a break from everything. And you're the only person that can make that decision. You're the only person that can actually tell your mind. Just relax. To just take some time off. So that you can focus on your body getting in touch with how you feel physically and in the process of this body scan where you focus on different parts of your body those parts focus on and observe, even though you're not purposely requesting for those parts of your body to relax, it's kind of expected, you expect when you listen to my voice to feel more relaxed naturally. Because when you're listening to me, your attention is focused on my words. And as my words guide you to focus those parts of your body, your focus increases, which actually calms your mind, and when your mind body relax 
taxes. started the focus on your body, you can already feel that healing energy spreading through your body, pushing out stress and tension. of your body, including your skin, your bones, your blood, all of your organs inside your body, all of the muscles, all of the fat, all of everything, every hair on your body is filled with that healing energy. feeling of comfort, of relaxation, increases. Deeply increases. In a way that starts to feel perhaps a bit drowsy, because it's not needed, and it may start to drift, That's what's needed. So if you're listening to this and what you need is deep relaxation, that's what you'll get. If what you need is to fall asleep naturally and easily as your mind drifts, that's also Because by pressing that play button on the podcast and listening to me, you give permission for your body and your mind. In fact, you give the command to your body and drift off to sleep, if that's what you want or need. And as I focus on the different parts of your body, i
focusing on the different parts of your body. yourself drifting. But you don't realize you're drifting until you stop drifting. And you get you alert again to my voice focusing on a different part of your body starts to relax even deeper. Because that drifting Basically, you already in the sleep zone. And the more you drift, the longer you drift, and the longer you drift, and eventually that drifting continues into sleep. If you do fall asleep, it's extremely pleasant, so relaxing, so deep, healing sleep. Feel that healing energy spreading through you, relaxing you so deeply. Relaxing you so 
let's focus again on parts of your body. Focusing this time on your forehead. Now on your mouth, your lips, your tongue, the whole of your mouth. Focusing on your fingers. a little bit so you can focus on each one individually. Both hands. And even though as you focus on both of your hands now, they may seem to just melt into one. your right hand start and your left hand end, almost as if they just mix together. Now focusing on your knees, just noticing how your knees feel. on your elbows, focusing in on both of your elbows, just observing the feeling of your elbows. sensations in your ankles.
sin. How your entire body feels. Notice Letting go. Letting go. Letting go of everything. go letting go letting go I'm going to start now and I'd like you just first of all just to see yourself lying down on that massage table lying on your front your head is supported your arms are supported and you feel comfortable and the breathing is really easy and you feel You feel confident in how you look as well. So there's none of that issue of body problems or shyness because I'm a professional and this is a therapy session. So none of that stuff matters whatsoever. This is about you. This is about how you feel and how you can enjoy that sense of comfort and relaxation that comes from letting go and allowing my hands and my fingers to relax you by massaging your body. I want to start off just by placing my hands on the back of your head, just gently, just so you can feel what my hands feel like really on you, so you can maybe feel the warmth of my hands on the back of your head, I'm going to move my hands to the side of your head, not pressing but just Holding there very gently. Maybe over your ears and a little bit on your face. Just so you can feel my hands. So you can become accustomed to them. And now I'll put my hands on the back of your head again and gently. Let them slide down onto the back of your neck. You can 
and feel my hands. Gently stroking the back of your neck to start with. Just so you can get used to the the feeling of my hands on your skin. Get accustomed to it. Realise that you're safe and it's all good. It's all fine. And I'm going to start gently massaging the muscles in the back of your neck. both hands. Now this is a very trusting situation really because our necks are so fragile and to have someone have their hands around your neck in that way can sometimes be problematic for people which is why massages are quite good because it allows you to relax and to get in touch with trust to feel peaceful and calm and as I massage the sides of your neck gently Moving from the bottom of your neck, which would be sort of near where your shoulders start, I guess, all the way up to your jaw, your ears kind of area, that side of your neck. Of course, is a lot longer than the front of your neck. Massaging the, the back of your neck, especially that area where perhaps we hold tension. And as that area is massaged, you can actually feel a sense of release in the back of your neck. And maybe you can breathe it out as well. Notice how it feels. Notice how you feel. Then moving down to that area between your neck and your shoulders. That muscly area. Starting to massage that area on both sides. I mean, this would be the area that a lot of people would massage if they were going to give you like a shoulder massage. Even that's not technically the shoulders, but it's all the muscles that lead to the shoulders. From the neck. And again, that can hold tension and stress. And when massaged, sometimes a nice deep massage is useful. And you decide how deep that massage is. And just allow my knuckles just to dig in to get to those muscles and to really relax them. All the time being firm yet gentle with you. And just stroking down that area to your actual shoulders. 
move into the muscles of your shoulders. And maybe initially just pulling up the shoulders a little bit off the table, just to give you a little bit of a stretch, but very gently. And you've got the muscles at the front of your shoulders, the sides and the back. This is a part that can really take quite a bit of pressure, quite a bit of uh, kneading, if if you wish, to really release the tension, to really get into those muscles and let your fingers in there. And it can feel really nice. Sometimes it's just being stroked gently or being massaged quite strongly. It can all be beneficial to the relaxation. Of the muscles in your shoulders. Now as we move down your arms, we do one arm at a time, starting with your right arm. What I'll do is I'll just lift your arm up, just hold it to the side of you. I want it to still be attached. And I just massage the tops of your arms. All the way down to your forearms. Into your wrists. Gently massaging that part, the softer part, which is the under part of the arm, which leads to the crease in your elbow, the inside. It's much more sensitive skin. Sometimes just having that stroked can feel really nice, pleasurable and relaxing. Now moving down to your right hand. Just holding your hand in both of my hands. Just pressing gently on the back of your hand and stretching your fingers ever so lightly. At the same time, Pressing down and massaging each finger. And then starting to massage the palms of your hand. Just turning the hand gently. Stretching it gently. Actually having your hand held can really be 
an emotional experience sometimes, even if it is with a stranger, someone you don't know very well, like a massage person or a therapist maybe, because it's intimate. safe and as I put that right arm back down where it was I'm going to do the same with your left arm exactly the same Massaging the muscles in your arm all the way down to your wrist. Stroking the inside of your arm. Just being gentle or as firm as you require. Massaging your left hand. Stretching the fingers gently. Massaging the palm of your left hand. So comforting. Now just rest your left arm back down. Start to massage your back biggest part of your body, starting at the top, starting again where we would have been, that area at the top, in between your shoulders, and then your neck, going back, massaging that area again, but this time moving downwards. a downward stroke to the middle of your back, working from the outside inwards, so massaging the, your back but the, the outsides of your back, the parts where your arms would maybe rest against, almost the part that connects your front to your back, and just massaging down firmly but gently as firm as you want, moving down and then moving across a little bit and moving all the way down again, being very gentle, yet firm as you choose. And eventually we get to the spine. We can massage the muscles on either side of your spine from the top of your neck all the way down to your lower back. You can 
do that a few times. Sometimes we can use the knuckle or the, you know, two fingers and just go either side of the spine. Almost just push down, go all the way down to the bottom of the spine. Each time releasing tension and opening up the body, stretching the body so that you feel more relaxed but at the same time rejuvenated. to one side, to your right side, and from the bottom of your ribs to your pelvis, we're going to massage that area of your back, I'll stretch over the other side and I'll pull the muscles gently and massage and push from one end that side all the way to my side, or to the middle in fact, to where your spine is, massaging that side of your spine, the opposite side to where I'm standing, it's almost like kneading bread, there's that big area which is firm, yet lots there to massage, Potentially one of the most important places to actually have a massage because you really feel it. You really feel the release and the pleasure of having your lower back massaged. It releases so much from your body that's not useful. Starting a healing process, which will continue long after this recording is over. And massaging this part of your body not only feels really good for you, but it's actually fun to do. Because it is, as I said, like kneading bread. It's a part that you can really get a hold of and really massage deeply if that's your choice. And then I'm going to move over to the other side of your body and do the same with the opposite part of your lower back kneading and massaging from your sides all the way to the middle of your back where your spine is. Pressing and kneading. Firm and gentle at the same time. It feels so releasing. This mixture of pleasure, comfort, release, calmness, relaxation, all mixed together. Plus there's that feeling from your stomach as it's being stretched. Even though you're in your stomach now, you can feel it being stretched because that whole area is connected to your stomach. Now we're going to move, we'll move further up to your top of your body and I'm going to do the same. This time starting 
here, your upper back, put my hands forward over and massive massage in that area up to your spine, from the side of your body up to your spine. So some of that massage area, the muscle tissue, uh, or whatever, fatty tissue even, will be possibly from your chest. So it's all connected, the chest and the back connect together. I'm going to be massaging and just pulling some of that skin from your side up and massaging that area of your upper back all the way to your spine and then I'll move down a bit and I'll continue with the middle of your back doing exactly the same thing as gentle or as deep as you choose the other side again and do the exact same thing with the top of your back on the other side from pretty much underneath your arm area really to your spine and then continuing down, including your lower, your middle of your back. Now I'm going to go to your thighs, the backs of your thighs, and the sides of your thighs. Starting with your right leg, massaging the back and the sides of your thighs, gently and firmly. There's a lot of muscles there. It's an area that can be very tense at times and maybe needs a little bit more pressure than the rest of the body. That's up to you. You can gently stroke the back of your legs where, you know, opposite your knee joint or underneath your knee joint. It's a very sensitive, gentle area. Then working down to your calf muscles, massaging your calf muscles thoroughly and deeply if you choose, using both hands, your fingers digging deep. In the back of your back of your ankles, just gently massage in that area. Maybe lifting the leg and stretching it a little bit. Moving to the right foot. Massaging the bottom of your feet and the sides of your feet.
gently but firm enough so they don't tickle. And just allow the pleasure that you get from having your feet massaged to just overtake you. As I continue to massage your feet, the bottoms of your feet, the sides, your arches, your heel, you can put a lot of pressure into your heel and it feels amazing, yet the arches need to be a bit more gentle. Stretching your toes gently and massaging the bottoms of your toes with my fingers, each one individually. And moving over to the left leg to do exactly the same thing. Starting with the top of the thighs, working the back of the thighs and the sides, massaging deeply and gently that whole area, working all the way down. This is an area that maybe you could like to spend more time relaxing and massaging. So perhaps if you wanted I could make a future recording where I spend more time on one particular area. As you move down your calf muscles, massaging your calf muscles firmly and gently, moving down your ankle and to your feet, massaging backs of your feet, bottoms of your feet, stretching your toes and massaging each toe individually, and that feeling of pleasure and release that you experience when you're having your feet massaged, feels really good. Turn over in your mind, laying on your back. I'm just going to start again with your neck area. And your shoulders. Just to Get back in touch with that area. As you move up, I can clean my hands, make them all fresh, because now I'm going to massage your face gently. Starting off with your forehead, your eyes are closed and you can just stretch your eyes a little bit, pushing up on your eyebrows. Just 
just massaging around your scalp. Massaging down your cheeks, around your ears, into your jaw, gently. The sides of your neck. chin, and just moving down from your neck down to your chest, starting by massaging the very top of your chest. collarbone is, either side of the collarbone, and just massaging the whole of the chest, moving the chest around, Because it's quite a large area, you can move from one side to the next, moving my hands underneath pretty much where your arms are, stretching up, stretching some of the muscles of your back in the process. Moving up over your chest, and then moving down again. And then allowing my hands to just massage gently and slide down towards your stomach starting in the middle of your chest and then gradually my hands moving apart and massaging and sliding at the same time moving down to just below your rib cage. Massaging up again, giving your chest all the attention that it needs to feel completely relaxed. Remembering that I'm also going to be focusing on your sides as well an area that really doesn't get much attention, but feels really good when it's massaged. Just stroking my hands down the sides of your body, from just below your arms all the way down to your hips. moving to your stomach area, I'm going to stand one side of you like I did when I did your lower back, and we're going to do a similar process of just stretching the muscles from your side, gently massaging. one side to the next, moving that whole area from below your ribs all the way down to below your 
belly button. around to the other side of you and repeat that process of relaxing deeply calmly you feel loose you feel free and something about having your stomach massaged that's different from any other part because we do have a tendency of holding a different kind of stress in our stomachs that we may not be aware of as I now massage your stomach the front of your stomach making circles around your belly button then going the other way around there's a gentleness and a freedom that comes from feeling how you're feeling As I now move down the tops of your thighs, the muscles massaging them, and I can do this with two legs at the same time, pressing down, massaging deeply those muscles in your thighs, in the front of your thighs. down to your knees, gently massaging your knees, sliding down your shins, putting pressure on either side of your shin, gently, softly, but firmly, moving down to your ankles, Stroking the tops of your feet. And then with each foot in each hand, just gently massaging the whole of the foot. The top, the bottom, your heel, your ankle, your toes. Massaging every part of your feet. Feels so good just to let go. Enjoy the process. Enjoy feeling so deeply relaxed. comfort and so many feelings that come just from touching your skin and you can just lie there for as long as you choose Enjoying the feeling of deep comfort from being massaged by me. Enjoy feeling deep. going to 
to do is blow out some candles in your mind. There are going to be a hundred candles. You're going to blow each one out individually, one by one, starting at a hundred as I count down. to one and each time I say a number you can imagine that candle in front of you and I'd like you to actually physically <sighs> gently blow that candle out Just so it's not a big blow, it's just a gentle, and that candle will extinguish, and then I'll say the next number as we move down, and you can just. Blow that one out as well. And as we move down the numbers, you'll find yourself feeling more and more relaxed. If you need to sleep, you'll also find yourself becoming incredibly tired and sleepy. In fact, you may struggle to blow out all 100 of these candles. As you feel to me after a while and even though there may be background sounds where you are you'll be aware of those sounds at the moment just not even notice them at all because they're unimportant where I am I've got the sounds of the birds Horace the pigeon 
it likes to say hello sometimes. And as your plane goes by, there'll be traffic and trains in the distance. But none of that seems important whatsoever. say and then you blow that candle out too so easy so simple going to start by introducing the first candle, which is a hundred. The first candle, which is one hundred. Positivity growing within you. Relaxation and sleepiness. Expanding. Starting. Candle ninety. 
No.
Fifty-four. Fifty two.
28.
Ecke.
let go of all of those thoughts, worries, concerns about the past, thoughts about the future and even things you've been thinking about today. Just let it all go. Because none of it is useful in this moment. This is your opportunity to just focus on feeling relaxed, allowing yourself to get in touch with that natural sense of peace that we all have within us. It's available for everyone. It just sometimes takes a little bit of effort to set up the right time and place in order for you to just let go. Because when you do decide to let go and relax, that's what your body starts to do. Because you've chosen, you've chosen to just allow your body to unwind and your mind starts to slow down. And it's a nice feeling. It's a nice feeling at the beginning just to know that you have chosen to decide to, to relax deeply and because you've made that decision your body will just follow suit because sometimes all the muscles in your body need is just permission from you to relax Because so often we're busy, we're going from here to there, we're walking around and we're doing stuff. And the body doesn't have any time or space to really relax deeply. So it kind of waits for you to lead the way. Waits for your permission. And when you do give your permission, when you give the say-so, when you say, okay, it's time for your body to let go completely and relax totally. Your body just follows. It's all like a breath of relief. Ah, oh, good, I can now relax. That feeling at the end of a day, of a very physical day that you may experience in the past, where you get home and you just sit down on a chair, maybe you kick your shoes off and, oh, oh it feels so nice. Knowing that you don't have to get up again for a little while at least and if you choose you can just sit there for maybe an hour or two and it feels blissful and just by sitting down like that your body knows that it's time to relax your body has been given permission from you because it's a mindset where your mind, you're prepared to let go of everything and to just completely allow all of the stress of your body to evaporate. And when you 
tensions can just gradually vanish. It's almost like magic, really. Because that sense of relaxation in the body is a very natural state. It's not something unusual. It may feel unusual when you first start to relax if you if you haven't really spent a lot of time focusing and giving yourself this space to let go completely and relax. It may seem almost alien. But it isn't. It's actually the most natural thing in the world to let go completely, to relax totally. The most natural thing in the world to allow yourself to feel is almost like a literal unwinding. It's like you press a button and all the tension just releases. And it's like a wheel, like a cog, like the inside of the clock just unwinding. And it's almost like you could see the the little wind up knob that's used just going the opposite way that you would use to wind it up. And the energy, that frenetic, stressful energy, gradually winding down, losing its power, losing its strength. As the sense of relaxation becomes stronger, and deeper and you may find that the more relaxed you feel that your mind starts to wander maybe you seem to stop listening to me for a while and your mind goes somewhere else and then you realize you're listening to me again. And that was just your mind drifting to sleep. Which is quite natural. Because sometimes when we're stressed and tense, we not may not actually be aware of what we need that we physically or emotionally need in this moment. But when you allow your body and mind to relax completely and you let go of all thoughts, concerns, worries, ideas, all touch with the feelings of such relaxation. It's, it feels so nice to be in touch with the calmness of the different body parts as they become looser and looser. seems easier and more natural and effortless as that cool air enters through your mouth or nose into your lungs breathing in comfort and relaxation and 
and just breathing out any excess remaining tension and stress from every part of your body and mind. And as you start to focus on your mind, maybe you notice that things are come to a standstill and maybe just as much and much slower than before because your mind is not really needed when listening to my voice which allows your mind to relax just as deeply as your body synchronicity between the relaxation of your body and the relaxation of your mind lets you know that feeling completely calm, loose and positive benefits for your body, your mind and your life to be able to let go of everything and to relax completely in all parts of your body and mind. Even your bones are relaxed. Muscles are relaxed. Even the skin that covers your body is relaxed. Every hair that you have feels so. starts to feel the benefit of this healing relaxation. And as you focus on the inside of your scalp where your brain is, you can start to realize and notice to relax, he sends those messages to the rest of your body and your mind to really relax even more deep. Because they're no longer necessary in this moment, in this moment of deep relaxation and calmness, filling your brain with deep, concentrated
these ever-increasing sensations of comfort that are spreading throughout your body. do a body scan, focusing on firstly how you feel in your body, not trying to change how you feel, not trying to relax, not trying to move away from any discomfort or stress or tension, just accepting, observing and accepting how you feel different parts of your body, just allowing yourself to be exactly as you are, to notice 
to get in touch with how you actually feel in this moment. So I'm going to start off by focusing you to move your hands around, just maybe move your fingers a little bit, open and closing your hands very gently, just so that you can get in touch with how your hands and your fingers feel. Focusing now on your feet. And if you can, just do kind of an equivalent with your feet as you've just done with your hands. Maybe turning your ankles, moving your feet around, moving your toes gently. feel in this moment. Focusing now on your eyes. I'd like you to just focus on your eyelids. Maybe you can open and close your eyes a couple of times to really get in touch with how you feel when you do close your eyes. The muscle changes in your eyes when you do close them. Maybe raising your eyebrows, which stretches the tops of your eyes. Perhaps squinting your eyes. scrunching up your eyes, just so you can really get in touch with all aspects of how your eyes feel right now. Now focus in on your thighs. I'm going to just ask you to gently tense your thighs, just very, very gently, just enough so you can become more attuned to the physical sensation of your upper legs, the front of your thighs and the backs of your thighs, noticing and observing how your thighs feel right now. to the back of your neck, just noticing the back of your neck, the muscles, and of course they lead to the side of your neck, they also lead to the top of your back, which lead to your shoulders, so as your focus on the back of your neck, Maybe you can move your head gently upwards as if you were looking up. Maybe moving your head down as if you were looking down. Perhaps moving your head 
side to side, right to left, but only very slowly and very gently, not trying to force Just so that you can be more in touch with the feelings, with the sensations, the physical sensations of how the back of your neck feels. of your arms, the parts where your biceps and your triceps are, between your elbow and your shoulders, as you focus on those parts, the tops of your arms, and they like to just tense them, but very, very gently. in any pressure whatsoever on your arms, it's just so that you can gain more of a sense of how your upper arms are feeling in this moment. Noticing as you gently, very gently and slowly tighten the muscles and then let go. Notice how the tops of your arms. Just above your groin. Maybe you're able to tense these muscles in that area very, very gently and slowly. If that's difficult thing to do, maybe you can just move your body, pushing your stomach up, maybe moving a little bit to the side, using your hips, just so that you can get more in tune with how physical sensations of your lower abdomen. As you move your attention 
chin to your mouth. Noticing your lips inside your mouth, your teeth, your gums, your tongue. Just noticing how your tongue and your mouth feel. it gently against the side of your mouth and then to the right gently to the side of your mouth perhaps pressing up against the, the top of your mouth and then down gently against the bottom of your mouth Just rotate your wrists by moving your hands in a circular motion very gently and slowly, just so that you can feel sensations that you are currently experiencing in your wrists, perhaps moving your hands up and down, and again just above your hips, where your coccyx are, and the whole area, which also really does include the sides of your body, because those muscles are very much connected. Those 
those muscles also move into your hip area, connecting to your buttocks, the sides of your hips. And if you're physically able to do so, physical sensations of your lower back. As you now move your attention just, if it's okay to do so, gently open your mouth, not wide and then stretching, just very gently and slowly opening your mouth and closing your area, and you don't need to do anything to move your chest, because it moves every time you breathe, and it moves very gently. 
lips up every time you breathe. And if you want to notice that, usually as you observe your upper back and your middle and upper back. muscles and those bones in your midsection. Noticing how your hips feel right now. You can very, very gently move your hips. Everything starts to slow down. Including the thoughts in your mind and your mind itself just starts to gradually it doesn't have to be instant, but just gradually starting to, it's almost like time is stretching. It's a slower pace to maybe what you're used to in your day-to-day -day life. It's a slower movement of energy. Very 
small movements which make up the larger movements which is always the case and when you move your hand it might seem like it's one movement but it's lots of minute different muscles moving in accordance with each other and what happens in this space that we're sharing is we move from that big movement into those smaller movements. Starting to focus on how your body feels, not just as a whole, not just, oh, I'm feeling this way, I'm feeling stressed or tense or I'm feeling relaxed and calm, I'm feeling this way, I'm feeling that way. starting to notice that your body begins to present to you small feelings around your body. Small physical sensations in your legs whether pleasurable or not. And maybe resisting the temptation to label them or to judge them, those feelings, and just thinking them, thinking about them as just being neutral just feelings not being particularly concerned but just noticing what your body is telling you the feelings in your arms Instead of feeling the whole of the arm, maybe notice those individual feelings, all those different muscles and the skin, the hairs of your arms, the, all the internal parts of your arms, the veins. Just being aware of maybe your elbow on your right arm has a certain feeling, maybe your left wrist also has its own individual physical sensation. about your forearm and your right arm. Your right forearm there may not be any particular feeling that you could even give a name to. It may not feel like anything other than just 
a feeling that it's there. The feelings in your shoulders. Perhaps your shoulders, when you think about them, kind of almost like they're the same, you know, the same feeling. Almost like your both of your shoulders are just one thing. Of course they're not. And when you focus on your left shoulder, and then on your right shoulder, maybe you find that you move the muscles a little bit. Tense the muscles gently. Noticing the difference in each shoulder. Your lower back. side of your lower back and the right side of your lower back. And of course that connection to your buttocks and to your hips. And also moving up into the middle of your back. And sometimes, like right now actually, when I focus on that part, when I focused on my buttocks, and then I focused on my, the middle of my back, it almost felt like the muscles in my lower back were being stretched, very gently, just stretched a little bit. Even though I wasn't doing anything to try to stretch the lower back, it just seemed to happen. The feeling of very gently stretching your lower back. along that feeling in your chest just noticing what sensations you Experiencing in your chest right now. And there's so much of the chest. Obviously, there's the collarbone leading to the chest. You've got the chest bone, you've got the muscles in your chest and of course if you're female there's possibly the breasts if you're male you've got the different I might not that different these days but there may be more muscles at the top of the chest But at the side, underneath, it's pretty much the same, whether you're a man or a woman, there's muscles there, muscles that stretch out to your back, as well as breast tissue that stretches 
and moves into your back. So just being aware of your chest. feeling there is in the chest. And when I notice that I focus on my chest, I feel it in my, my back, my upper back. I guess the obvious reason would be because, you know, I'm breathing. In. And it stretches my chest and my back at the same time. Yeah, it feels... It feels okay. Feel a little bit of pain in my right chest. A little bit, not pain, but a little discomfort, maybe stiffness, possibly. I don't know. I notice my shoulders are also wanting to flex for some reason. That's probably part of my upper back. That connection between my shoulders and my upper back. So I can move my shoulders and stretch the muscles in my back. Moving the shoulders backwards or up. Which then moves the, I think it's the scapulars your back it feels quite nice actually the good thing about this is you can if you want to you can just flex or Stimulate the various muscles in your body gently in order to get more of a sense of how they feel. And when you're relaxing and you do tense a muscle, go and you let it relax, it relaxes way more than it would normally. And you have to feel that you're able to do that. There's no point doing it if there's a, uh, an issue with a per part of your body. need to be gentle with yourself at all times when you're relaxing deeply it's important to be kind to yourself Notice your mind, how much has your mind slowed down since we started this recording. calm and peaceful 
peaceful as your mind right now. You have nothing to think about, and just my voice to listen to, because you know the intention behind this recording is relaxation, at the very least for you to feel more relaxed at the end of the recording than you did at the beginning. At the very least. For your mind to slow down. As your body continues to relax. Because that's what you want to happen. That's what you expect to happen. The relaxation. To feel your body, maybe calming your mind to the point of boredom, when you start maybe to drift. as if you are moving further away from your body and your mind, just leaving that there. Kind of like in a, an escape pod in a spaceship, like a movie space movie, you know, when they get into that little pod and it sends them <laughs> far away from the spaceship.
soon I might be there. But those individual parts of a body that are relaxing one by one. You may find that every now and then you realize that you weren't listening to my voice. Your mind started to imagine something different. Maybe you started to almost move into some kind of a dreaming state. And then you become aware of my voice again. on my voice, you may also wish to allow your mind to just drift naturally into that space of comfort and safety. body like a warm blanket covering you gently keeping your body at just the perfect temperature to matter anymore. There's that sense of peace spreads through your mind. Like a gentle breeze strong enough to blow away all negativity, strong enough to remove from your mind any anxiety and stress that was there before. that is filling your body and your mind. you felt 
the same mind. I count them from ten down to one and each number you hear. Your mind will become Just a slight movement from nine down to eight, just another small change in how you feel. Eight down to seven, you have that feeling as like a gap that starts to get wider, the gap between those feelings that you used to have in your mind, compared to the feelings you have that are growing now, feelings of comfort and security and Seven, seven down to six. And when you get to five, your mind will start to have a certain physical sensation. Almost like there's a magnet outside of your head sucking tension and the stress and any remaining feelings that you don't want, sucking them out through your skull. When you're down to four, you can start to really experience that sense of not just emptiness, but space. A place full of fresh air. A place where you can stretch. It's almost as if as you go down to four and three, your mind is expanding with this sense to one, your mind just feels exactly how you want it to feel, almost a perfect feeling, maybe a, a sensation place that's safe where nothing can affect you at all. And you can stay in that, that space of comfort and confidence in your own ability to create this space and this feeling of comfort within your own mind just by counting from 10 down to 1. 
this is something that you can do yourself and then on your own. A time when you can maybe sit down, maybe just for a few minutes. Close your eyes. Just count slowly from ten down to one. And then you experience these feelings in your mind. And when you feel that system into every part of your body, travels through your bloodstream, healing and relaxing every part of your little existence. this several times before the end of the recording and then you can practice on your own each time you count from ten down to one the feelings of comfort calmness and Deep relaxation becomes stronger and deeper. Filling your mind and brain with these positive chemicals that spread throughout your body, relaxing you. Just by counting from ten down to one. And we're going to do it now. I'm going to count from ten down to one and I'd like for you to repeat the number after me. So when I say ten, you can just repeat to yourself. Notice, be aware of how you feel. In your mind and your body. And then when I say mind, you can repeat to yourself. Noticing the increase in comfort and calmness in your mind and in your body. The same when I say eight. When I say seven. say five, four, when I say three, two, and the last time when I 
necessary for you so that you can adapt so that you feel you want to say the numbers 10 times a year faster than I do then go ahead and do that but if you feel you want to do it yourself also to do. And when a plan can turn you into one, and when it gets to one, then it will be the end of this recording, unless of course you're listening with music will continue. Ten.
Sim. Noticing how you physically feel, having counted down from 20 to 1, allowing stress and tension to leave through your fingertips and your toes. And as you focus on your fingertips, maybe they feel a little bit tingly, which is perfectly understandable considering the tension has been exiting your body and through your fingertips. So now we're going to count from 20 down to 1 again. This time, you're going to feel relief of tension and stress and the anxiety that you might stomach, just leaving through your stomach, almost as if it's just releasing the whole of your stomach from the navel to just above your chest and below your chest area, so surrounding your belly button area and the whole area, you can feel the tension of your body, whatever's left, just releasing from that area and you may notice that your stomach is looking very relaxed as you count down from 20 down to 1 9 20 
Philippines, three trips to Japan for holidays, and a couple of friends down there for summer. There's a lot to see and study in three months. And with this hyper focus, just do a little scan of your body. There's a lot to see and do in three months. Focus in on your upper body. listening to this recording will feel so right and let go completely of everything. Let go of how things are in us, energy, time, moments and space. you can feel free to open your eyes in this focus as well put your forehead into your eyes start hovering your head to the back almost as if you were wearing a mask you know like a like a batman mask or something or a shit <laughs> zorro or something you know the kind of mask that covers your eyes but also covers quite a lot of the forehead Focusing on that area because that's the area that you know you're going to release tension and stress from your mind, from your brain, and from your mind. And any tension that you may have remaining in your face, in your neck, in your jaw, in your eyes, in your forehead, you may have scanned. Sixteen, fifteen, 
physically
yourself some space to breathe easily, to think calmly, and just to take a break from all that pointless worrying and concerns about things that you don't need to think about. in your mind, your heart and your body, as you feel so good, so nice, just to not have to do anything, to be able to really enjoy that serenity. I'd like you to make up your mind who you're going to meet. And I want to explore that with you, what it feels like when you actually decide who you're going to meet. Not forcing yourself, but giving yourself that, I guess it is a command really, isn't it, when you're telling yourself, relax, and you gently but firm know that only you can really tell yourself in that way, it's like when you have someone else saying to you, you know, relax, relax. Unless you're gentle, but you can't, someone else can't really have the same, the same kind of influence or power that you have over your own physicality, over how you feel. Because when you say, test it out, you can do little tests, do little tests along the way, and you can get more of an idea of the force, the positive force that you can have in creating a sense of comfort and relaxation in your body and your mind, how quickly just by you telling yourself
to start by just, just focus on your hairs. So focus on the hairs and just tell your hairs to relax. So just say relax as you focus on your hairs. You could say my hands are relaxed or I want my hands to relax. And I think if you actually do it directly Focusing and imagining that your hands can hear it this time around with the little ears that you have at the moment. So talking to your hands and just say, relax. Focus on your eyes, so tell your eyes to relax. So just saying the same word, relax. Now find the right tone for you. So now I might say, relax. So you, you might say, relax. Or, relax. Or, you know, you, you might say it differently to yourself. That's important for you to gauge what feels right for you. So just tell your eyes to relax whilst focusing on your eyes, your eyelids, the muscles around your eyes, your eyebrows, and just tell your eyes directly, relax. did that myself and sometimes you may feel that you need a bit more time for the different parts to relax and I just don't feel good about that and maybe one part doesn't really fill it and what will happen is that you actually start to relax even though I feel good and it's happening Something else I noticed is when I started focusing on my eyes, they actually almost became, they got worse before they got better in a way. I saw that I felt a degree of tension growing in my eyes and then disappearing. So I think what that was really was just me becoming more aware of the tension that was already there. Focusing on that thing, but I wasn't really acknowledging it or um, really conscious to them or to that. Hands have got a certain kind of movement, not not buzzing, but a kind of feeling a degree of energy in your hands. Maybe that's why the tension is being released. Maybe that's causing that. focus on the back of the neck. That's a part that often, um, well for me, holds tension. I don't know about for yourself. Um, I think it's quite a, a standard place where tension is something that holds. So, and I'm, I'm doing it 
exactly what you would do in a Final Fantasy game. So I'm going to play with my body parts and that sort of thing. If you play with my body parts, they can sing better than me. I can sing really good. And I am one of the most talented vocalists. I can sing out loud and I can just sing it to myself. And that's how I do it. But you're focusing on the sound started noticing feelings in my shoulders, tension in my shoulders and in my upper back. Whether that was because I was in the back of my neck and the sound was really quite bad, it's the other parts that I need attention. But my lower part, my back of my neck is still relaxed.